All right, hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome uh, to another RWI saw live webinar. What a show today! We have a such a big show. Let's say uh, we're gonna test the mic with Hassan. Hassan, can you hear me? One, two, three. One, two, three. I can hear you. How you Great. doing? Great. Good, 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 good. We'll be back with you in uh, in just uh, a minute or so. I'm looking for Victoria. She's supposed to be helping me today, and she's not around yet. So when she comes in, we'll we'll bring it right in. So let's get going. Nobody wants to listen to me. They want to listen to you guys. So let's get going. All right. So we already uh, been doing this for four weeks, and we have reached over 21. 100 referees, almost 2,200 referees from across uh, across the world, unbelievable, from all over the world, from New York to LA, from Chicago to Dallas, as far west as uh, Hawaii, and east as Puerto Rico. Amazing. Amazing. We have referees from 43 states representing 76 NISOA chapters. We also have referees from nine different countries. It's just unbelievable. For the past four weeks, we already have almost 2,200 downloads. So our shows were downloaded almost 2,200 times. So we really thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, RWI saw webinars was something that started just for our chapter. And we're expecting to have five to 10 referees logging in every week. And from the first day, you guys been unbelievable. We had over 300 referees logging in the first time and it hasn't stopped ever since. So thank you everybody. Thank you very much. We are a NISOA chapter. All the information about NISOA can be found uh, on the website, NISOA. NISOA.com, how to become a college referee, how to get assessments. As a matter of fact, we have someone from NISOA that will be helping us out a little bit today about how the National Referee Program works and how we can get assessments and, and, and those good things about refereeing. Um, we are able to do this to give you all this uh, lineup of world-class referees and experts due to the uh, support from the NISOA Foundation Fund. Uh, that information can also be found on the uh, NISOA website, nisoa.com website. If you are a chapter president, uh, chapter vice president, representative, uh, log into the website, find the NISOA Foundation Fund, and they'll be able to help you with clinics. They'll be able to help you with funding to promote your chapter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So just a reminder today, your questions, since we have too many people, we're not going to be able to just take everybody's uh, questions live. So to make it easier, email us your question to rwisoa at gmail.com. That's rwisoa at gmail.com. And we'll bring you right uh, into the um, into the webinar, so you can ask that that question live. But unfortunately, due to the number of referees all at once, we won't be able to uh, uh, allow you to ask the question live. So remember, email your questions at rwisoa at gmail .com. All right, so like I said before, we have a great lineup today. Uh, we have uh, Ref6. Uh, they're going to be presenting their uh, referee app. It's a great tool. Um, I love it. And they're going to be talking more into um, how their, uh, their program works. Uh, we're also going to have uh, George. Uh, uh, a new gem, there is. Uh, I missed the uh, 
the uh, PowerPoint for a second. Um, he uh, He's going to be talking about assessments and um, he's going to be talking about the referee program, NISOA referee program. He happens to be a NISOA Hall of Famer and he is the uh, senior director of um, uh, evaluations for NISOA. Uh, with us today as well, we have, uh, we'd like you to have uh, Carolyn Chenard, uh, Canadian FIFA referee uh, for many, many years uh, with so many achievements. We're so uh, lucky to have her. Um, she's gonna be with us later around. Um, she's gonna be talking about life and refereeing and so many other good things. And then at the very, uh, and but not not least, we have uh, Lent, who's going to give us a great presentation about focus and concentration. Uh, for those of you that don't know uh, Lent, he happens to be the NISOA Director of Operations, and he's also CONCACAF uh, Manager of Refereeing, and uh, he actually refereed the 2018 NCAA Women's Cup. So, without any further delays, let's see if we can bring in our friends from um, uh, Ref6. Let's see if we have um, Hassan with us. I am here. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Doing well. So, uh, Hassan Rajwani. That's it. He's the CEO and co-founder of Ref6, and he's here to talk a little bit more about this product. Uh, I love the product, so I'll tell you what, so you can really focus into uh, your presentation. I'm going to give you the power, so you can, uh, it's going to be all yours. Thank you. And the power is yours. Let me know when, when I'm on screen. You are. You're good Perfect. to go. Great. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Hassan. Uh, I am the CEO and co-founder of Ref6, um, and I'm just going to spend 10, 15 minutes potentially chatting through our app and, and kind of giving you an overview of, of what it is and what we do. Um, so our app is basically a um, mobile and smartwatch app. It's designed for soccer referees at every level of the game. Um, and we really try and focus on, at the moment, how we improve match day for soccer officials. So the first way we do that is to try and digitize match administration, being able to record goals, cards, substitutions, player names, all directly on a watch without having to get your piece of paper out um, is something that we do through our smartwatch. Um, the app works on a variety of different smartwatches, whether it's an Apple watch or an Android watch or a Samsung watch. So whatever watch you 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 look for in a smartwatch, our app will work on. Um, and then, yeah, the first the first piece is all around match administration, ensuring, you know, if you give a player a, a two yellow cards, the, the watch will remind you uh, to send that player off and things like that. So we've got match administration covered. The second's around timing. Uh, different different uh, referees like to time games differently, especially in college level, you obviously have a stopping clock too. So we enable a variety of different timers that you can customize and set up specifically how you wanted them. So for example, you might want to have a, a countdown clock with a count up clock um, that stops every time you stop the clock. Um, in the second half, you might want it going from 45 to 90. Um, all of those kind of customizations are within the app. The, the, the third piece and uh, one reason uh, a lot of referees use our app is to see uh, performance data about their physical performance in matches. So things like a heat map, things like seeing how um, how far the referee is covered, where the cards have been given on the pitch. Those are things that our app can can offer value to you. Um, and the last piece, because we're collecting match data and physical data across multiple games, we've created a, an area called Trends, which basically looks at your data across your career, across your season. Um, to pull out uh, interesting kind of data and insights about your performance. And I'll, I'll touch upon that a little bit later. So um, just based on time, I just wanted to give you a kind of uh, a very brief overview of how you would use the app. So first you'd use your mobile phone to create the match. So you'd say who's playing who, how long the game is, um, how many subs are allowed, etc. 
And then uh, when you get to the game, you can either add the, the roster in if you'd like, um, and that's completely optional. You don't have to add the add the roster. So once you've once you've set up the game, you send all that information to your watch, and the watch is the only thing you need when you're when you're officiating on the pitch. Um, so during the game, basically, you, the the watch acts like a timer. So you start the game, you select the team that's kicking off, and then during the game, you may need to record different incidents. So you just swipe left or right depending on the a team, whether it's the home or the away team, you can select yellow card, red card, goal or substitution. And on the screen, I've got the example of a yellow card being recorded. So you click yellow. Uh, if you added the, the roster in, you'd, you'd select the player name. Um, then you choose the reason and then it will be uh, recorded in your watch. So that would record the time, the person, the reason and also the location on the pitch of where that yellow card was uh, distributed. So uh, we have a variety of different features within the app, what you can use during the watch, uh, during the match. So uh, being able to swipe up uh, during the game to see a quick overview of all the things that have happened. Um, you can record uh, cautions and dismissals for team officials, which was a new IFAB uh, law from last year. I know that's slightly different in, in college. The college game um, but you can record cards for players as well as team officials um, and really the exciting part comes after the game is where you can see a variety of different things back on your phone so the first thing on the left hand side of my screen here is just a very simple overview of uh, the match record for your game so all the different events that you've recorded on your watch whether it be a goal a card or a substitution uh, you can see that all in chronological order as well as uh, on a team lineups page. Um, the next piece, you can see physical data, like I said about your performance in the game. The, the first piece here is a heat map. So you can see where you've covered on the pitch. You can see how far you ran on the pitch, would show you the distance, first half, second half, and over time if it goes there. Um, and you're, you're able to quickly filter this based on uh, if you just wanna see where, where did I get to in my first half? Was I wider, was I not? Uh, did I get wide enough in my second? And then um, a recent addition to our a kind of performance tracking is a sprint map. So we break down your, um, your, your running into sprints and we can figure out are they low, medium or high intensity and then just where were they on the pitch? Um, so we can show you a sprint map there. Um, on the right hand side is basically just showing you that uh, all of your matches get logged in our app so you can come back and all your games are a touch of a button button so you can go through you um, and, and click on any of these matches to see the performance data to see the match report in each of them and and the last thing to say is everything's shareable so um, on the on the left hand side of the screen you'll see the share icon you can share that either on social media or you can share that by uh, by email to your assigner or to the, the league representative that you need to send it to. So that's basically how the app works on a match day, you know, creating a game, using it during the, during the match, and, and then seeing the data post game. Uh, obviously, I've got very static slides here, so definitely, uh, if you can get a chance, uh, go to YouTube and just type in Ref6, and I've got a proper interactive demonstration of me talking you through the app um, a little bit more kind of uh, in detail. Um, the last thing I wanna note just quickly about our app is the trends area that I mentioned. So these are just some examples of some of the information within the trends area. So what our app will do is go through all of your games and pull out what we found or what we think are interesting insights. So for example, the number of yellow cards you've given, the average you give per game, the, the matches with the most yellow cards, where you're giving yellow cards on the pitch, um, even down to kind of what are you giving yellow cards for, what are the codes that you're, um, or what are the reasons you're, you're mainly giving yellow cards for. Um, so that's a lot to do with ma um, uh, kind of match incidents and match events, but we also look through your performance data to see, you know, how, what's your average distance that you're covering in a game, uh, a graph to show you just how well you've been doing um, in terms of distance over the last 10 games and then your top matches. These are just some of the things we go into. We also go into sprints, heart rate, um, and a variety of other kind of things like match results too. So definitely something uh, for everyone there.
Um, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so uh, 2019, um, uh, at the end of 2019, we, we took a look at kind of the numbers that have been uh, being used um, throughout the app. And if you want to see more detail, you can go to 2019.refsix.com. But basically, we had uh, almost, we almost hit 100,000 matches refereed using our app um, last year. Um, seeing as a, a Premier League season, for example, only has 380 games, um, we think this is a pretty good uh, starting point for, for of which to base ourselves on for the next couple of years going forward. So 95,000 matches across 95 uh, countries in the US was kind of equal top in terms of number of matches with, with the UK and, and got a lot of active referees. And on the map, you'll see all the games roughly where uh, referees have um, uh, used our app uh, across the country in the US. So that's pretty cool. Um, in terms of uh, the price of our app, um, it is free to use. You can download and uh, the app and use it for free. Uh, whether you're on an iPhone or an Android, you just search for Ref6 and download it. Um, you'll get access to match administration, some basic timer options, and then just being able to log and track every result that you've ever had um, for free. And then if you wanted that access to some more detailed analytics like the trends, like the heat maps, um, the price of um, the app is six, $6.50 a month or $65 a year. Um, and when you equate that to kind of a college game, uh, we think that's a, a, a pretty affordable price mark um, on there. Um, in terms of some other services that you might be interested in, we've and this is probably more from an administration side, we've created a referee coach app. So if you're a referee coach and you have a variety of mentees that you work with who use our app, maybe you want to be able to access and see their data so referees can share their data with you. And then if you're a referee who's getting their games recorded, uh, we have a video analysis tool which enables you to correlate the video with your watch data. So you can kind of click on a yellow card and it will take you to that point in the video. You can click a sprint and it'll take you to that point in the video to see why you sprinted in that in that specific instance. So some other things that uh, I'm definitely happy to answer questions on, or if you want to get in contact with me, um, you can you can just reach out to me directly. That would be great. Um, just while um, obviously um, we're, we're going through some strange times at the moment, everyone's um, hopefully staying safe, but uh, a lot of people have a little bit more time on their hands or are at home. What we've done to try and kind of help in the situation uh, is two two things. Uh, we've created a page on our website. If you just go to refsix.com and click on news, we've got an online referee development page. And basically, we found all of the sessions like this, all of the webinars um, that people have put on over the last six six weeks and put them in one page. So there'll be stuff from us. We've got interviews with uh, MLS referee like Rosenda Mendoza and Alan Kelly, um, but also we've tried to collate things from like the English Football Association to RWI SOA uh, webinars, uh, CONCACAF staff, um, so loads of things and loads of resources in there, and we're pretty much updating that daily as we find new things. The last thing on the right is uh, we've created a, a competition on Strava. If you wanted to join our group, it's called Ref6 Referees Community on Strava. And basically here is us trying to keep you accountable for staying fit during this period. Um, anyone who does over two hours of training or three sessions a week gets entered into a prize or draw to win some merch. Um, this actually is uh, the final week of that competition, but we're most likely going to roll that over into May and continue it going forward. So if you're on Strava um, or if you just want to stay, uh, feel accountable for staying fit, definitely check out our, our community on Strava and, and get, 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 get yourself on that. And the last thing um, that I wanted to share was uh, just for joining this uh, webinar and, and, and actually for showing that you're, you want to continuously learn. Um, we wanted to we wanted to create a prize draw. Um, so basically, anyone who does this will be entered into a prize draw, and I'll draw it out on Monday. Um, all you need to do is download the Ref6 app, um, go through and create a match, and just use uh, RW ISOA webinar as your competition name. Um, and then, like I said, on Monday I'll draw a random winner, and the winner will get one year access to Ref6 Pro, um, and obviously that will 
uh, start when the season resumes. Um, so please definitely, um, if you're interested, download it, uh, create the game, and I will be in touch with lucky winners on Monday. Um, that is me. Uh, I don't know how much time we'll have for Q&A, but um, if, if I can't get to you or if we can't get any, uh, any questions answered now, my email is hassan at refsix.com. You can reach out to us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. Um, we've got some videos there. We've got some, some great content going out. So definitely, if, you, if you're open to it, we'd love you to follow us. Um, uh, but mainly stay safe uh, during this time and, and keep, um, keep providing your eyes for this type of content. These webinars are great. So Richard, thank you for organizing and letting me be part of it. Uh, no, very welcome. Uh, we're going to take a question from uh, David Nunez. Hi, David. Mm -hmm. Hello, David. I guess he, he went for a walk or something. <laughs> David Nunez. Okay. Yes, I'm gotcha. here. It's oh, okay. You there now? Good. You got, go ahead. Back to your uh, I, was, I was trying to work things out. <laughs> That's why. Go ahead. Where are you calling from? Uh, right now, San Diego, California. San Diego, California. Sunny San Diego. <laughs> I've been here just for a few weeks so far. So, but so far so good. Can't complain. Good, good, good. What's your question for uh, Ref Six? Uh, my question is more of how the data is actually stored. I mean, for example, do I have to actually sync manually? the data uh, to the phone once they get close to the phone or whenever, or is that automatically synced? Uh, if someone is actually holding my phone, are, are they able to kind of monitor what I'm actually doing in the field? Sure. Um, so at the moment, uh, thanks, David, for your question. I hope, I hope San Diego is nice. Um, definitely somewhere I want to visit. Um, in terms of uh, the, the data, basically, it's stored on the watch until you click a button on your phone in the changing room when you get back. So there's no live streaming of that data currently um, from your watch to your phone. You have to manually click a button after the game's finished to download it from your watch. And it takes a, probably about two seconds. All right, Hopefully so great, works. great. Uh, we have another question. I'm just gonna ask that question because I tried to connect them and I couldn't connect them. So the question mm -hmm. is simple. Uh, can we use this watch, can be set up to do uh, like indoor games, or futsal games and stuff like that? Yeah, um, you can definitely use it um, uh, for indoor matches. The, the one thing from a futsal perspective that we don't have right now is counting of fouls. But th those are things that we may be looking to add in the future. But the one thing to note about indoor games is you won't get GPS signal. So getting things like your distance or your heat map is not possible, um, but you'll still be able to use it for timing and match administration. So. All right, great. Cool. Um, that was great. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having you. Great, me. Great, great system. I really like it. Um, and hopefully, um, uh, what what are we gonna do? Because I, I, I'm, yeah, I, I got like thirty questions not popping up all at once. We definitely don't have the time for the questions. But what we'll do is, I promise you guys. And, and, and gals, we'll, we'll forward all those questions to uh, Hassan and he'll answer every single question. Right, Hassan? Uh, I'll do every single one. Just send them over to me. It's getting late here my time, so I'll probably do it tomorrow. <laughs> no problem. And again, remember, whatever he said, something about creating, uh, downloading the app, creating a competition, name it under RWISOA webinar, and for a chance to uh, win a... Uh, what is it? Free one year pro? One, one year free Ref6 Pro, exactly. Yeah. So it's worth well 65 it. bucks. Um, I've already seen a few people following us on YouTube and Strava. So, firstly, thank you for that. And uh, hopefully, you enjoy the rest of the show. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's move on. Um, just for, for a couple of minutes, I want to have. Uh, someone from NYSOA very briefly to talk about the na um, National Referee Program. Um, so remember questions, email them to rwisoa at gmail.com. So we have with us 
uh, George uh, New John, James, uh, New James, George, let's see if we can get to George. He is in California. George. Yes, sir. Do we have you? Uh, yes, now do I put there my webcam? Okay. Oh, yeah. Hi, we can see I'm, you. How are you? I'm doing magnificent. It, it's it's sunny. I'm very close to San Diego. So before you get to San Diego, maybe you can come and visit me. There you go. <laughs> That'll be fun. Um, so George, just uh, briefly, you're you happen to be a NYSOA, um in the NYSOA Hall of Fame. Yes, sir. And you are the director of evaluations for NYSOA. And National is, Referee Program. And the National Referee Program as well. And you were for a long time the South California SRA, correct? For 10 years. For 10 years. And now you're just strictly uh, college uh, business. Is that right? Yes, for now. For now. <laughs> I love it. All right, what can you tell us about the National Referee Program? Okay, now, number one, I want everybody to know, NISOA is moving in the perfect direction for today's soccer game. A lot of changes have been happening in the past two years. A lot of new faces are coming into NISOA, and I'm very proud of every one of them. Okay, and I will still persist and continue to support the new revelation in NISOA soccer. Let me talk a little bit about the assessment program. Okay, the assessment program, you know, we need to make some changes to reflect that the referees are there to learn from the assessor, to be coached by the assessor. Okay, and there's no longer going to be, well, the way I did it, the way he did it, the way she did it, that's not going to happen. We need to retain referees. And if we have nothing after the game to bring up to their attention, we should not be an assessor or a coach. OK? So this is a gist of the program. And within a week or two, OK, we're going to be naming, most likely, a director of that program administratively and we're going to be distilling a lot of education to everybody. So please be patient. Give me about a couple of weeks, and then we will be there. And today, we split. If you if you see it on the okay here, the assessor, the assessment is a different tab versus the national referee. So now, you know what? I'm not into micromanaging anybody. I think the chapter assessor should be dealt with the chapter. Okay, and then we're going to have some ref coaches added to the NISOA. The qualification for it will be listed, and we're going to have some national assessors evaluation. So now maybe some of you should just log in and see what's available right now, subject to change. Okay, let me switch gears at this point and go to the National Referee Program. As you all know, we used to have the 300 number of national referees. And in the past two years, with the help of a lot of the new faces in NISOA, okay, the physical fitness is mandatory. And we are going to up the ante going forward. Okay. Uh, the requirement will soon be available for everybody to see. Okay. So now we are making some changes, positive changes to accommodate the younger referee, the upcoming referees. Okay, now we have about 112, 114 referees. So the requirement is getting a little bit harder. Okay, um, if there are any questions, you know, I just gonna give you an overview and I'm gonna let every one of you know that you are extremely lucky to log in today because what I said today to all of you a lot of the the soul members don't even know yet. So we're lucky, lucky to have you. Uh, well, let me okay. throw a question. We can, actually let me find someone who has a question for you. Um, Patrick, 
Let me get Patrick here. We have time for one question because we have our guest uh, speaker uh, on hold and I don't really want to make her mad. She should be mad because I'm running late and that's not fun. So Patrick, are you there? Yes, can you hear me, George? Yes, sir. Can you state your first and last name? Yes, George. My name is Patrick Violet. I'm from the RWI SOA branch in New York. Yes, sir. How can I help you? I have a question about, um, has there been any discussions with NISOA about any modifications, I don't know if you know this, to the upcoming season due to the COVID-19? Yes, we are constantly working. We are constantly working. Have you been logging in and taking the quiz every week? Some of those quizzes are going to be part of the requirement for upgrading to a national and so on. So it's going to be part of the requirement. Yes, sir. You know, we are working very hard around the clock. Okay. And there's more going to come and, and it's going to be actually discussed and be put on the website. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, I have been logging in and I forgot to tell you, I am a national referee. I've been a national referee since 2013. Okay. Now I want to make sure I want to make sure everybody has my phone number to me. I communicate best on the phone. Okay. Best, best on the phone. Now, if you guys got already, I'm going to give you two seconds. Okay. Nine, five, one, five, zero, five, eight three four eight and we will we'll email that uh, tomorrow uh to everybody uh that was uh, uh attending the uh, webinar we'll send them all your information so everybody knows so uh george yes, thank, sir. You. thank you thank you for honored. taking five minutes from your busy life no you know what i'm very honored and i'm very happy to have been on this webinar in here really appreciate it and if you have nothing to do uh if you don't mind spend a few minutes uh we have a great uh guest speaker coming up um and i'll be in contact with you i'll be calling you later for some other stuff all Very right good. I'm, I'm not gonna move from my chair <laughs> all right thank you george thank you sir and thank you everybody for being patient great thank you so that's uh, George um, uh, New Jam, um, I saw a Hall of Fame, Senior Director of Evaluation, and the man in charge of the uh, National Referee Program for NISOA. Uh, let me bring in Victoria. Victoria, are you with us? Hi, everyone. How are you? I'm here. I'm doing How great. Are How are you today, Rich? I'm doing great. You know, we're okay. running a little behind and i apologize but i have my i, I can blame my three-year-old for that <laughs> toddler scapegoat love it <laughs> all right so we have carol ann with us um carol ann how are you can you hear us i can hear you loud and clear can you hear me loud and clear great great uh before we uh, go right in let me uh just uh go through next week's lineup uh, very quick, we have Terry Vaughn coming in to give us a nice uh, talk. Um, everybody should know who Terry is. Uh, we have Ryan coming back for a uh, violent behavior versus uh, fighting uh, presentation. Then we have president of NYSOA, Gary Hoover. He's going to stop by to give us a lot of news about NYSOA and the new direction that NYSOA has taken. And then we'll have a uh, World Cup referee and many other titles. Uh, good friend Corey Rockwell, and his presentation is going to be amazing. Uh, he's not going to take anything away from focus and, and concentration from uh, Lance tonight, but it's going to be different. And the reason for that is we are actually going to have a live uh, upside uh, quiz. So we're going to have an advanced upside instruction, uh, FIFA level, done live. We'll give everybody access to an app, and you're going to Pretend you're a FIFA referee and hopefully, you know, you get good marks. So it's going to be a great, great um, um, a webinar next week. But of course, not as good as today. So questions, remember, you have questions for uh, Carol Ann, please email it to us and 
I'll make sure all the questions I've answered uh, right after uh, this nice interview. And Victoria is here to help me with that, aren't you? Yes, I am, sir. Go right ahead. Um, all right. So, hi, everyone. This is Victoria Cantanzaro. I am a member of RW ISOA. Um, we're super excited to have uh, Canadian FIFA referee Caroline Chenard with us today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about her career, some life lessons she's learned um, along the way through sports and officiating, and just take questions, as Rich said, um, as we progress. So just as a quick overview about her career and Carolyn, we'll go into more detail on this, but went to the 2011 and 2015 Women's World Cup, uh, the 2012 and 2016 Rio Olympic, uh, Olympic Games, and then, of course, in Rio, her standout performance got her the final between Sweden and Germany. Um, of course, she's been very vocal and outspoken about her experience last summer when she was all set to head off to the 2019 Women's World Cup in France um, before being diagnosed with breast cancer just days before that. Um, and then off of the pitch, aside from being a top class official, um, in my personal opinion, I see her as an inspiration in the fact that she has been able to have this career on the field, but off the field, she also has a PhD in microbiology. She's been a competitive speed skater for the Canadian national team, had a couple of medals from there, and she's trilingual. So if you're like me and needed a little bit of motivation to make your quarantine a bit more productive, I think Caroline's story can provide that little burst of encouragement that you might need. So with that, I will stop talking and hand it over to Carol Ann to start talking about her career. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation. I don't really have, um, you know, a real formal presentation plan because I think the most, um, the most important and I think the easiest way to get something productive out of um, this is to have a conversation. So I hope you, if you have any questions, please send them along because otherwise this will be pretty short and sweet. Um, maybe what I'll say is a little bit about um, about my background and what you've got a little little uh, sneak peek and, and how I got started refereeing. So um, I grew up in Canada, but I did live in... Uh, pretty much in right across uh right across the country my father was a um I, I i knew a referee that actually had like a little snack like a gummy in their pocket and they all and they always ate the gummy at the same point in the first half and the second half and it really helped them refocus i know people who do the like dig their fingernails into their hand or do you know they play with their whistle in a certain way but i think the most important is you have to be able to recognize when you're losing concentration. And, and um, once you do that, you'll be able to figure out how to get it back. But I do feel like you have to have the basics down. You know, you have to be having that kind of um, habit so that as you're resetting, you're not creating more problems uh, for yourself. So if you've done the work, um, you can mentally reset. Maybe it's a word, right? Some people, it's just a word. Like I, I, I definitely, when I train, so when I'm out running or if I'm on the treadmill, I sometimes picture myself on a counter attack, you know, from one end of the field to the other. And I have these sayings that I'm like, Oh, you know, and that helps me focus. And, you know, whether it's, if there's two players and they're the last two, you know, it's an attacker and a defender. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, if he goes down, it's yellow. If he goes down, it's yellow. Or if he goes down, it's red, you know, that kind of thing that keeps you focused. You have to figure it out for yourself, but that's what works for me. Plus, I swear a little bit too much on the field too, so it means my my assistants don't have to hear me swearing if I'm uh, focusing a little bit on some of that terminology. That helps for that helps me at least. All right, that's great, great, great. Uh, let's see, if we can find Audra. If I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Hey, hi, how are you, Audra? Am I hi. pronouncing it right? You are. Well, full name and uh, where are you calling from? Hi, my name is And your question, Audra. obviously. <laughs> yes, so I'm currently living in Ohio. Um, I first want to thank you, Carol Ann, for uh, sharing your story. I find it very inspiring. Um, I actually am also a microbiology PhD student currently at the Ohio State University. Um, so I just wanted to ask you kind of while you were in school or even now balancing your work plus refereeing plus your personal life, 
Um, you talked a little bit about it from the refereeing side, but could you talk a little bit about it from the work side and kind of how you're able to tell people that you do this as a hobby? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that story, that's a story of my life, I guess, now. Yeah. Um, for sure. I think um, for me, the approach I've always taken is is when I'm at work, I'm kind of really trying to do as much as I can to support people, to be flexible, so that um, when I'm away, people aren't, you know, saying, oh, that Caroline, she's always away in some warm place refereeing soccer, um, you know, like I'm on vacation. <laughs> Um, so I do work really hard when I was in school, I, um, I would always offer to take my exams early or, um, you know, whether my, um, my supervisor needed something, I tried to as much as possible do it early. I tried, I was really, really organized in the sense of play, as much as I possibly could, knowing that tournaments and games and things would come up was to try and plan as best as I could so that it didn't have as much of an impact when I was away because I could either move important experiments or or things like that. And, and so it minimized the impact on others was the approach that I kind of took. Um, also, I think the more you share about refereeing and I think people used to say like, okay, well, where are you going this time? And I mean, there were times I thought, like, I don't want to tell you because you're going to think I'm going to, you know, the Cayman Islands on vacation. Um, but the more I shared and the more they actually saw me either refereeing locally, you know, here in Ottawa, we have a um, we ha uh, had a, uh, a semi-professional team. And so there would be people in the stands. And when we had the Olympics here, I did a game in Ottawa and people saw me and and then they it started to click in their mind that this is what I did and it was a hobby and but I but I really loved it and I felt that it contributed to uh, my work and I, I will tell you uh, uh, when I was applying for jobs at the end of my PhD um, I had refereeing at the very bottom in my like other kind of category right I had um, it, it was like one little bullet I didn't highlight it anywhere because I always thought people would be thinking I'd be away all of the time. And I mean, I always had, the, had to ask the question about leave and that kind of stuff. But when I ended up um, having a really serious offer, and I, I've been really lucky to work for the federal government, but it was actually, so one of my other bosses, my, my PhD supervisor actually told the person who was um, doing a reference check that, you know, I was a referee. And I think he thought, it, he was saying it kind of like, oh, you, you know, she's going to be taking some leave, like you better watch out. And she took it the complete opposite way. She said, you know, you know, I had some skills. I was confident. I had other things in my life. They felt that this was a real kind of bonus um, for me and for them in the office. Um, so I got really lucky. And then, you know, throughout my career, now that I'm older and I'm talking to people who have hired me before that I worked for before, there isn't one person who didn't say that me being a referee didn't positively influence uh, my abilities in the office. And whether that's people management, um, reading, reading people in meetings and reading the game, being, you know, action oriented, being result focused, that kind of thing. So I think you can, you can play those kind of things up. Um, and, you know, the more I, I speak to people and the more I do do speeches like this, the more I realize what I learned too in my PhD and you know when I was skating, that can apply as well to 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 my refereeing career. So um, but balance is really important. And honestly, you're gonna have to be one of the most organized people out there, get a good calendar, figure out something that works for you. And you know, you have to do a lot of advanced planning for sure. And uh um I always try and uh you know what do they say? They say uh gather your your brownie points before you need to use them that's kind of that's been my approach <laughs> <laughs> great um Audra, let me ask a question did you watch the 2016 uh, olympics final by any chance well, um, well, I'm, i don't want to put you on the spot have you ever <laughs> seen carolyn uh refereeing yes sir i have uh, it, it, now did did ever cross your mind the one day you were going to be speaking to her no, never. How long you been refereeing for? Um, I think 13 or 14 years. Would you like to become a FIFA referee one day? 
Uh, yeah, that's that's the plan for right now. So think about that. You were watching Carolyn doing a, a match on TV, and you were like, how fantastic. She's doing a great job out there. She's representing um, uh, the female referee. She's doing a great job. She's a great referee. Now you want to become one of them. Guess what? You're talking to Carolyn. So most likely, if you keep, you know, working hard, one day you'll have that white patch. Am I uh, wrong, Caroline? Nope. You know, the sky's the limit. You just got to kind of, you know, control your career, do what you can, work hard. You know, like I said, I, I so it was a Friday night game in a, in a pub league, basically, that uh, started my career. So, you know, work hard every single game because you never know who's watching. And I think that that's really true. Hello? All right, well, Rich, are you still with us? Might be having trouble with his mic. I thought I, I, I thought I got lost as well. Uh, I'm hearing clicking. <laughs> There's always a technical difficulty. I'm honestly shocked we've made it this far. So we are getting progressively better every week. That's amazing. I still, I think it's really great. All like having hundreds of people on, on a webinar is amazing. So I, uh, I really feel like it's, you know, a real testament to your organization and to the referees that are wanting to learn every, every week. This is amazing. Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously the current situation, wanting to keep ourselves sharp and learning and the forefront of everything, obviously, and I saw Foundation Fund has given us um, some support in this sense, but it, we never expected it to blow up to the way that it is now, especially on a Friday night when anybody can be watching primetime TV, they're they're sitting here just chatting with a couple of these referees, no big deal. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, they could be watching reruns of The Good Doctor, you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so let's try Bill one more time to see if we can get him. Uh, Bill Kinney. Yes. We have you, you have a question. Yes, I was wondering, do you, what was your, how many youth games did you do? How long did you do youth? And do you go back and do youth and mentor the younger referees that are coming up through the youth youth ranks? Sure. So, of course, I started, yeah, refereeing youth soccer. So, I, like I said, I began refereeing, I guess I was like 14 or 15 years old. And, you know, I didn't do, and so that would have been in like, I'm going to age myself again, 1992, 93. And you know, I didn't become a FIFA referee until uh, you know 2006. So I absolutely did a ton of uh, of youth games and continued to do them. Um, you know, into until you know even in my early um, early years as a FIFA referee. Um, I currently don't really referee that much youth soccer, but I do mentor a lot. Um, I try and get out um, and and see young referees. Um, I really believe that um, in order to retain young referees, there needs to be some uh, mentorship around them to help them through the difficult, the difficult games. I've always said um, that it takes a heck of a lot more courage to walk into a local pitch with 50 parents than it does to walk into um, a stadium of 50,000 people because the local pitch, everything is personal. You can hear everything. You know, in a big stadium, it's like a hum and it's, I mean, it might be a loud boo, but it's, uh, it's definitely, it doesn't, it feels less personal. So I think it's really important to be out there supporting young referees, um, giving them support, talking to them a little bit about my experiences, giving them some coping tools, you know, being young um, and, you know, dealing with adult parents and um, adult uh, coaches is, is not easy. And so if we can get them through kind of that, that hump, um, I, I hope that uh, we can help uh, kind of retain them. But I haven't done a, a, a youth game. It, it's been a while now. I, I was in Montreal. So I've been in, in Ottawa for 10 years now. And uh, I think that was my last youth, youth, real youth game was probably uh, 
probably in, in Montreal. So. Yeah. Thank you. Bill, where are you calling from? Uh, I'm calling from Wichita, Kansas, part of the Kaisoa chapter. Very good. Right. Look at Kansas. We cover the whole country, the whole, the whole northern hemisphere. I had some good barbecue in Kansas. I had some good barbecue in Kansas. There is some good barbecue. <laughs> I'm a regional assessor here. So uh, and I've been uh, doing not only this webinar, but the NISOA webinars that they've been doing on a weekly basis. And it's an awesome tool to be able to have. And kudos to everybody behind the scenes that are putting the training on for all of us. We're great to have you. Great to totally have you. Totally agree. Totally agree. All right, so uh, we do have uh, some giveaways, right? Um, and this is how we're gonna do it. I'm gonna try to get um, somebody now to talk a little bit. And while we do that, uh, let's see if we can make this work. There you go. Lance, you with us? I am, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you loud and clear. So this is how we're gonna do this. Right now, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, both questions, right? Uh, whoever gets the answers right, we're going to give away um, two T-shirts and two uh, Ritz bands, all right? So I'm going to publish the questions. You'll need to email your answer to rwisoa at gmail.com, rwisoa at gmail.com. And the first uh, correct answers that popped up on uh, on the email, I'm going to click the person's name live, and I'm going to have them give the answer live, and we'll give them uh, some some uh, some of those uh, T-shirts and uh, Ritz bands. Is that, that's, is that good? Is that a good deal? And while we do that, you can talk to uh, Carolyn a little bit while I get the uh, the answers. Is that right? Does that work? Sounds perfect. All right. That, is that okay with you, Carolyn? I don't want to hold you much longer. That, that works for me. I have nowhere to go. We're in. We're. I'm. I'm homebound. So I, I'm. <laughs> I, I have all the time in the world. <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll have. Uh, oh, wow. I just posted, and I already have a <laughs> lot of people popped up. And I tell you what. Um, the answer should be easy, since you know, I ask you to repeat a few times. <laughs> All right, so this is going to be a familiar voice. And the reason why I asked to email it so that way we have a record, right, in case uh, they call the lawyers on me. <laughs> <laughs> the first one that popped up. So. Uh, Audra. Do we have you again? Hi. Do we have you again? I guess so. That's why I say the familiar voice, because guess what? You were the first one at 8.09 that popped up. So what is the correct answer? Is it 2006? I don't know. Carol Ann? It is 2000. If, if it, the question was, what is the year that I got my FIFA badge, that is correct. Yep. Correct. Great. So congratulations. Thank so you. would you like a, a, a male t-shirt or a female t-shirt? Um, how do they fit? Do they fit like a jersey? Uh, no, they feel like t-shirts. <laughs> like nice so t-shirts. Okay, I'll take a women's medium. All right, so we'll we'll put you as a women Thank and you. we'll talk about with the little details later. I'll reply back to your email uh, to get that um get the rest of the information so we can get your address. So very good. And we're gonna give another person as well. And the second one, since we have so many of them to give away, we're gonna give it to Esad. Esad, let's see if we can get you here. Since you gave the right answer, Isad, how are you? First name, last name, and where are you connecting from? Doing well, Rich. Uh, Isad Omanovich from Iowa. From Iowa. Well, congratulations. Uh, you're the second one, so we'll give you a male, unless you want a female, t-shirt. 
to <laughs> give away. Uh, otherwise, we'll give we'll send you a male's t-shirt. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And the same the same deal with uh, Isad. We'll reply back to the email, and uh, we'll connect that way to get the address. All right. Second question. So email the right answer. Meanwhile, Lance, if you want to talk to Carolyn a little bit while we get the answers. No, absolutely. And hi, Carolyn. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I, I'm doing fantastic. Uh, just wanted to tell everybody here, you know, a little bit about CONCACAF and our referee department and how we use the term excellence as kind of our motto and that's for referees administrators assessors everybody involved in the referee department and both on and off the field because good isn't good enough anymore we want our officials to be excellent referees and also excellent people and nobody personifies that more than you do carol ann and we are so proud of you the referee department everything you've overcome all your accomplishments and from the bottom of our hearts we cannot wait to see you back on the field i really really appreciate it um you know concacaf has been a really great support and really leading um kind of this modern modern um approach to the game and um you know you guys have in the it you know i feel like all of the new stuff that's come out in the last seven weeks i feel like you guys have been really busy the last seven weeks but i know it's taken longer than that and um you know i really appreciate it i um what I, something that you said there really kind of st stuck with me and people always say you know what what does concacaf look for what does fifa look for in in a referee and you know there is absolutely excellence on the field but they want good people off of the field. You have to be a team player. You have to support other referees. Um, you have to be their cheerleader. Um, you know, I don't want to get a final by stepping on somebody else. I want to be the best uh, referee for that. And I think that, uh, you know, excellence is exactly the word that um, I approach every game um, as. And I hope that that came across, you know, um, in, in my approach. And um, I, I, I really commend uh, CONCACAF for kind of leading the way. So thank you. I really appreciate that, Lance. And you're going to no, make absolutely. me tear up, so I'm going to stop talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, just from the elite course, too, that we had in Houston, uh, that, that was, a, it was a prelude to the Women's Olympic qualifiers that, that you attended. Um, you know, it was, uh, I don't know if many people realize this, but it was both men and women referees, our, our elite officials, and also our TARP referees. Those are our referees that are on the projection. Um, you know, it was uh, a, a mixed classroom, and it was great for discussion. And I think, and for my feeling of it, is everybody learns from everybody's experiences. And Carol Ann, the way I saw you interacting with with our our TARP, our talented advanced referee program members, those are our brand new FIFA referees like Nima Sagafi, Ruby Vasquez, to name a couple, um, really shows me that no matter the gender of the official is you're willing to uh, uh, take ownership of mentoring uh, the new wave of CONCACAF officials. And for me, being a, a newer employee to CONCACAF, you know, I noticed that right away. And I, I really feel that um, with, with people like uh, referees like yourself and, and Jair Marufo, uh, mentoring the younger generation, uh, you know, we're going to be in great hands for the future. You know, I've always said, um, if I go away to a FIFA event or to another event and I learn something and I come back and I don't share that information um, with others and they leave and make the same mistake, I mean, it, it reflects on CONCACAF, it reflects on the Canadian Soccer Association, it reflects on on me as a as a person so i think it's it's my job to to go and to learn and if i make a mistake i bring it back and i you know i don't need to like go on tv and say i made a mistake but if i if i'm open and i share that with the referees um you know i hope that that means that they won't make the same mistake and um you know at least um we'll have learned from from my experience so you know if i 
hopefully I get back on the field. If I can't, I know I'm going to give back um, in another way. Um, and so I know that uh, regardless of what happens, uh, it's not uh, an end of a career, but maybe a new beginning. Who knows? No, absolutely. And you always have a place at, you know, in our CONCACAF family. So I, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, um, that's emphasized because, you know, there's, for somebody of your um, accomplishments in, in the world of refereeing and, you know, a lot of the listeners here that are, that are listening tonight, I took time out of their Friday night to, to be part of this webinar. I mean, it speaks volumes and just the, just the hour that you've been on, um, you really touched on some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. And, and, you know, it's almost like you could hold your own webinar series based on your experiences that you've had at the international level. And so I just think that's, that's such invaluable information and advice that, that you pass down to the next generation. That's, uh, that's truly incredible. Thanks so much. So at least they know I'm not making it up if you're going to say the same thing. So that's good. <laughs> I'm here to back it up anyway. Yeah, Don't worry exactly. about it. <laughs> All right. So let's mention our two uh, new winners. Um, so I'm going to put him, uh, there are two of them. I'm going to put them together so they can say the year. Uh, it's going to be Tom Cassan uh, Grady and it's going to be Gordy. So just let me find him first, real quick. All right. You both um, uh, live now. So what was the year? 2016. Yep, 2016. Yep. Yep, you guys got it right. Uh, vintage year, vintage year. <laughs> and right, did they get it right? They, they got it right. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. All right. So, so you guys are getting a, a t-shirt as well, and uh, we'll connect uh, via email uh, right after the show. And what we're gonna do now is, since we got so many right answers, I'll tell you what we're gonna do. We're going to give away, I was going to give away some of those uh, uh, wristbands now, but I don't want to take any more time since we consume all the time. Good, good, in a good way. So tomorrow when we do the replay uh, on Facebook and on and YouTube, we're actually going to uh, put all the names of everybody that put that got it right. And we're going to give away two more t-shirts and 10 uh, wristbands. Is that fair? Sounds like a great idea. Great. And this is all for a great cause. All right. Uh, all for a great cause. Don't just wear the uh, the T-shirt, you know, just go visit the uh, American Cancer uh, Society and, and, and other um, uh, websites and, and foundations. And, uh, you know, just do it right. Um, you know, don't just say, oh, I want a T-shirt. Actually, I want you to become involved because uh, there, are, there are little things that we can do to uh, make a difference. And and I know uh, Caroline agree with agrees with me. So um, I don't know what else to say other than thank you, and sorry we took you away from your busy life for over an hour, but it was a pleasure. It was uh, a real pleasure. It was a real pleasure. And believe me, I'd love I'd love to think that I you took me away from a busy life, but you did not, and I really enjoyed it. So if you ever ever need me again, just let me know. Uh, you know what? You know we're gonna take you on that because of our women's program. So you'll be here, you, you, we're gonna be talking soon. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Perfect. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. A million thank yous, uh, Victoria. Helen, thank you so much for your time and sharing your story. And it's just been incredibly inspiring for me, for everybody on the phone, especially for upcoming female officials. So thank you so much. Thanks for letting me uh, talk to you for uh, for the last hour. I really appreciate it. So good luck. Hopefully we'll be back on the on the pitch soon, and I hope to see and meet some of you. And uh, all the best uh, in your season when it uh, when it officially restarts. Thank you very much, Caroline. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So that was Caroline um, uh, Chenard. Uh, what else can I say? Uh, there's not much I can say other than uh, thank you, a big thank you. Victoria, thank you for helping me out. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do what I did uh, behind the scenes if I didn't have you there. So great. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, we're going to have a great presentation by Lynch. Lynch, you still with us? I'm still with you. Great. 
So just before we go with you, just going to review what, who's coming uh, next week. We have Terry Vaughn coming in next week, and um, he's going to speak to us about his career and um, and about Huntington disease uh, since is uh, May and happened to be uh, Huntington disease uh, uh, awareness, awareness month. So we're going to be giving away some stuff um, related to that, some T-shirts and some some other stuff. We also have Ryan Sijic coming back, uh, NCAA uh, National Coordinator of Referees. He's going to do a presentation on um, violent uh, behavior, one and two versus fighting. And we're going to have our president, Gary Huber, coming in to talk about the future of NISOA and the direction that uh, NISOA is heading to. Uh, some great stuff there. And we're going to have uh, our friend Corey Rockwell doing a great, great live presentation on um, Upside. And it's going to be a live presentation. So just before uh, you log in, we're going to send you a link so you can uh, download a little app and you'll be able to interact with him. And it's going to be great. So, but today we have a great one. And that is Lance with focus and concentration. Lance, you want to take over? Thank you, Richard. Thank you for everybody for uh, staying on after Caroline's presentation. Uh, you know, they always say it's hard. You never want to follow a legend. And here I am attempting to follow a legend. So uh, Richard asked me to, to take uh, focus and concentration. Um, and there's a lot that we can go into with focus and concentration. You have the power now. Awesome. There's a lot we can go into with focus and concentration. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch on some stuff with it uh, before the match, during the match, and after the match. And a lot of this will coincide a little bit with what uh, Don Wilbur, when he talks about mental preparation, uh, later on in another webinar series. So Richard and RWISOA, thank you for having me. I feel like I'm one of your chapter members because of as much as we talk, uh, as many times as I've been up to New York to, to provide assistance with your chapter for training. And uh, also the fact that my wife is from, uh, from the New York area. So, uh, you know, I feel like I'm a, a native uh, New Yorker at times. So, so let's, let's get started. So we're looking at right now, focus and concentration. So what is focus and concentration? Okay, and I found this quote, even though it talks about effort, but I found this quote on LinkedIn the other day and I, I really wanted to save it. Now everybody knows who Dwayne Johnson is, The Rock, and he's, he's uh, He's big into motivation, and he talks about success, that anything comes down to this, focus and effort, and we control both. And that's the same thing with focus and concentration. We control both of those, so it's within our ability uh, to, to be successful based on them. Now, I also have a link here, but I don't think the link is going to play because it goes to YouTube, and it might be a little choppy. So what we can do for, for time purposes, we will skip that but I'll make sure to share this presentation uh, where, where um, it can be seen at a later time. So what is focus and concentration? Well, focus, pay particular attention to. And concentration, the action or power of focusing one's attention or mental effort. Now with focus and concentration, this is extremely important as referees. Before the match, during the match and after the match. It's your ability I'm gonna, to I'm gonna interrupt your focus if you don't mind and your concentration. Can, <laughs> can you um can you maximize the um the screen? It just became too tiny now and some people may not be able to see it. There you go. Sorry to interrupt okay. your concentration. No, no worries. So focus and concentration. So like for example, Richard interrupting me. Now, how do I gain back my focus and concentration to get back to the presentation? It's the same in a, in a soccer match. What do you do when something goes wrong in the match? How do you get back your focus and concentration? So we're going to discuss things about that. 
the more focused and concentrated you can be in a match, the more successful you're going to be. So my hope is to give you some, uh, some best practices, some advice, and uh, some, some other stuff that Carol Ann uh, had mentioned too about focus and concentration. So when does it begin, Richard? When does focus and concentration begin? That's a question. Okay, not for Richard, for Victoria. Victoria, when does focus and concentration be begin for you in, in terms of soccer, in terms of your assignments, your matches? Um, I mean, the second the assignment comes in, you're focusing on the game. For me, it's in training. You have to think about where you want to be and how you're going to get there. Uh, absolutely. You know, it begins now, right? So it begins now. It's, pre it's pre preparing you for success for your, for your big appointment or your next appointment. And, and you kind of hit you, – you talked about this in a roundabout way, but it starts with setting goals. And those that know me, I am a huge proponent of setting goals. Back when I was a grade six referee, now I'm a retired referee, but back when I was a grade six referee, it would have been uh, like 2010, uh, back when the U.S. soccer had the grading system. Uh, one of our state research clinics, uh, an exercise that we had was we had to, we had a sheet of paper that was a timeline. And we had to fill in our age and our current grade and then where we wanted to be. Now, back then, you had to retire as a FIFA referee at age 45. So that was the end, was 45. And it kind of really put things in perspective of where you wanted to be at certain points in your life and, and how are you going to get there. So my goals, like many inspire, you know, up-and-coming referees, was I wanted to be a national referee. Well, how do I want to be that? What age do I want to be that? And then I wanted to be a professional referee, work in the MLS. What age for that? And then I wanted to be a FIFA referee. And, and then I wanted to be an Olympic referee. I wanted to be a World Cup referee. So those were my aspirations. Now, putting it down on paper helps connect the dots because you have to be working in your professional game for three years at the highest level in order to become a FIFA, to be nominated for a FIFA referee. So those are things that will help structure. For me, it helps structure my, uh, my timeline. And then inside of that, you also have to, you know, figure out what's your plan? What are your weaknesses? How can you take your weaknesses and make them your strengths? So it's all about setting goals. And I talk about setting goals as a referee. I still have that paper, which is ironic. And it either tells me that I, I'm a hoarder because I keep all my stuff like that. Uh, or it's just something that really stuck with me throughout the years that I can look back at that piece of paper and say, hmm, I was really glad I wrote that down. Because even though I never <laughs> became a FIFA outdoor referee, I still was able to become a FIFA futsal referee. I still was able to go to the World Cup, and I still was able to go to the Olympics in futsal and accomplish all of that within this time frame. So it's pretty amazing to me that when you start setting goals and you start uh, figuring out your plan for achieving these goals, uh, the mind is a very powerful thing. And every time that I've sat down and been realistic about goals, I've always been able to achieve them. And I'm not a special person that uh, uh, has all these opportunities and whatnot based on luck. It's really because you put in the, you make a plan and then you put in the work. So we talk about setting goals here too. So, like, for example, everybody wants to set a goal around New Year's, New Year's Day. Everybody wants to set a goal for the new year. So, here's a statistic for you I found. 92% of New Year's goals end in failure. 92%. Out of those 92%, uh, 25 give up in the first week. Now, I can tell you personally, when I've tried to make <laughs> New Year's goals, it hasn't gone very well. Because typically it's not very thought out. It's not something that's uh, measurable. 
nor uh, sustainable. So just some tips on how to set goals. I have 10 tips here that I'd like to share, and it's always helped me. Um, the first tip, the step, is choose goals that are worthwhile. So if your goal is to get out of bed every day in the morning and make a pot of coffee, that goal really isn't worthwhile. It has to be something that's, that's really meaningful to you. Second step, choose goals that are achievable in stretches. Now, when I talked about my, my path uh, to age 45, which, you know, I'm not there yet, uh, but my path to becoming a FIFA referee and, all, and a World Cup referee and working the college cups and, and all my accomplishments, I didn't set that as the only goal. But I also I set that as the end goal. And then in between there, I had all these little benchmarks that I wanted to meet, um, like being a national referee, uh, going to youth nationals uh, as a returner, going to amateur nationals, uh, working Division I soccer, um, working a Division I final in soccer, a conference final. Those were all measurables and achievable stretches I was able to, to check off as I progress through my referee career, um, making your goals specific, being committed to your goals. And this is something that I really truly feel too, is when you make your goals public, you know, uh, a lot of us have mentors, um, our spouses, our family members. You know, I'm very fortunate that my brother is also a referee, uh, specifically an assistant referee at the national level. And so as we were coming up together, we were always talking about our goals. Having a close group of friends, some of my friends who I'm very fortunate to have that work in the MLS, you know, being able to talk to them about our goals as we were climbing the ladder, as we were uh, progressing through our referee careers. I mean, um, in being able to support one another. Prioritizing your goals. What's important to you? Um, make your goals real to you. So they have to be, it has to be something that's achievable. For example, if you're 18 years old and you want to be a FIFA referee by age 21, that's not, that's not achievable and not realistic because of the minimum age requirements FIFA has to become a FIFA referee. So make sure your goals are real to you. Also, setting deadlines to accomplish them. A lot of us have these uh, uh, grand goals in life, but if there's no deadlines, there's real no focus and, 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 and push to really uh, to achieve them. And then lastly, number nine and number 10 is you reevaluate your goals. A lot of our goals in, for officiating uh, can change based on uh, our life events, uh, graduating college, uh, you know, getting married, having a family, things like that, that can really uh, truly alter your timeline and makes you reflect and what, figure out what's now important to you and what's now important to your family. And then finally, reward yourself for accomplishments. You know, by, by having some sort of reward for, for making, accomplishing your goals really motivates you to, uh, to stay on, your, on task and accomplish more goals. So, you know, those are just 10 tips. And if you're, uh, if you're viewing this presentation, you can take a look at it and think about how this applies to you. Everybody's goals are going to be different. My goals were much different than uh, my brothers, than some of my best friends that are officials. And, uh, you know, and you have to dream big, but at the same time, you have to be realistic when you dream. Um, so, you know, these are really good. And, I, and I, I'm a strong believer of writing your goals down and putting them somewhere where you can uh, visualize them and see them. So what I used to do is I would write my goals down and then I would put them up in my bathroom, right by my, by my mirror, I tape them on my mirror. So every time I got up, every time I went uh, to wash my hands, to brush my teeth, the first thing I did was I saw my goals and that helped motivate me to stay on track. And then before I went to bed, when I brushed my teeth, washed my hands, I was looking at my goals before I went to bed. And I truly feel that by doing this really helped keep focus because there are times where you're going to be, you're going to lose focus. 
you're going to lose concentration. And it happens to everybody. But how do you get back on track is what really sets you apart and what keeps you motivated to accomplish your goals. Richard, are you still with me? I'll take that as a yes. So, off season. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yes. just so, making sure, so, just making sure. I was talking to myself. Uh, uh, I muted myself because I didn't want to bother you because, you know, I like to talk too much. And uh, and I forgot that I was muted. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I was just making sure everybody's still with me. Uh, oh, you so have, you have a lot about... of people with you. <laughs> we have a lot of questions <laughs> many... coming up, so be ready. That, that's good. How many people do we have tonight right now? Uh, right now we have up going up and down. Uh, we are 176 right now, and we have a max uh, of uh, 503. That's incredible. That's incredible. So, uh, they, so we're doing good. We're doing good. Keep no, on we're going. doing great. We're doing, as we say in Concord, we're doing excellent. <laughs> so, so, so now we're going to talk about off season. So, um, Victoria was was touching this where. You know, focus and concentration starts starts now. It starts in the off season. So when you look at your collegiate schedules, everybody gets excited when a signer starts releasing games in that February through April time frame. Everybody gets excited when they when they see that email that comes through through Arbiter or uh, Zebra or uh, what is it uh, Zebra Web uh, things yeah. like that. Spot Spot especially Zebra see. Web. They get very excited with Zebra Web. Everybody gets excited when they see that, right? So <laughs> that itself should drive you to to be focused for the season, for the upcoming season. Because before you know it, the se- it, it hits. We're in July, the beginning of August, and the season's right around the corner. So, what are some things we can do to focus and concentrate to help us be successful during the season? And part of that is studying the rule book and the changes. Now, I can tell you that, you know, the rule book is much smaller for the NCAA than it is for IFAB. It's more condensed. And what the rule book has, which is extremely beneficial, are these uh, additional rulings, the ARs that are in the rule book. And those provide you examples or scenarios that pertain to the rule. So those are extremely helpful. Um, highlighting those, going through the rule book and highlighting those, extremely helpful and help you prepare. Um, something we did this year with NISOA, which many of you on this uh, webinar are familiar with, and I hope you're not tired of the emails that I re- that I send to everybody, multiple each week, but it's, it's to make sure that uh, everybody has the opportunity to participate in the stimulus quiz. And one thing that we want people to do with the stimulus quiz is to open to dust off their rule books, open them up, and look through them as we're doing the uh, as they're doing the quizzes. I know for a fact for me, when I when I help write up the analysis of each clip, I go in and I look at where in the rule book is this found, because I want to make sure that I include that so that way everybody that's able to uh, uh, either partake in the stimulus quiz or partake in the analysis, which to me is the most important part of each video clip that you can find on nysoa.com in a PowerPoint presentation, is that it'll note to you for each clip in each decision where in the rule book you can find that justification. Because we really have to know the rules in college. Because coaches love to test us on them, because many of the coaches know the rules just as well as we do. And it's about how we can communicate with the coaches about the rules and justify our decisions. And it will help us become better referees. Um, The rule changes are coming out this year. Many of you have already seen them. They're on NYSOA.com. They're on our social media pages. Uh, They're on the NCAA hub. But a lot of the changes this year for the NCAA are in a line with IFAB. So it's great that the rules are starting to merge together. So we don't have to try to remember, okay, this is a college game today. I have to referee the college game with the college rules. Well, a lot of that is starting to come together now, which is, which is fantastic. But many of us in this country don't have a lot of experience 
with the IFAB changes. For example, the handling, not allowing uh, an attacking player to handle the ball that leads to a goal, um, even if it's incidental. Um, you know, the drop ball situation where, you know, the, with the uh, drop ball to the, uh, the team in possession or the team that last uh, touched the ball, um, uh, managing the wall when you have uh, three or more players in the wall, defensive players, and you have a, an attack here, uh, how far away they have to be from the wall. These are all new to us in U.S. soccer because we, we, they were adopted in IFAB in March of 2019. And by that time, all of our competitions were, were, already, uh, were already going on. So many of us, this is new to us for, for 2020. Uh, so it's very important that we're able to stay sharp focus and concentrate on the rules off-season fitness training obviously it's a little difficult now with with COVID-19 but it's a challenge how are people staying fit how is everybody staying fit uh you know there's a lot of different opportunities out there um you know everybody wants to buy a Peloton now that can afford one so it's a way to stay fit Uh, there's a lot of workouts that are online that you can subscribe to uh, I'll give a plug right now for my my good friend Jonathan Weiner in his Empire Fitness Gym down in uh, Homestead, uh, Florida, down near the Keys. He runs uh, off his Instagram page. He runs home workouts for free that they do live every morning. So that's a way to check out and to and they use you know items around the house for uh, for for resistance. So there's always ways that you can you can stay fit and stay sharp, and you can never be too fit. Because remember, you don't want a referee to get fit. You want to get fit to referee. And that's something that I know RWISOA really preaches because of your, your fitness program that you have and, and, um, and, the, and the, the manager you have running your fitness program. Right, Victoria? Uh, yeah, that's uh, Felipe, yeah, Rusi. Felipe Rusi. That's right, former FIFA referee. He's great. He's the best. <laughs> he he is, uh, is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to that. So it's fantastic. Um, and there's a lot of resources out there too, where you can stay fit in off season training. You know, another one of my friends, uh, Christina uncle, uh, many of you know, on this call, uh, she runs her, um, a, uh, the deadlift effect where it helps with not only with fitness, but also the mental strength. And that's a real, that's a real strength uh, and a challenge for many of us officials is we get fit, but it's not just getting fit, but it's also being mentally fit. Um, so I highly recommend you check out uh, Christina Uncle's uh, The Deadlift Effect as well. Uh, and lastly, for off-season uh, focus and concentration is attending and participating in educational initiatives. Uh, you know, being on the call tonight, many of you are, I'm sure, because I've been on, uh, we're repeat uh, listeners for this. Uh, even when I'm not presenting, I'm usually uh, logging in to listen to see all the great information that's being provided, the education, participating in the stimulus quizzes, uh, participating in, you know, going to clinics. When we used to have in-person clinics last year, whether it be the joint NISOA ECSR joint clinic that we had up there at uh, Fordham University uh, with RWISOA as well as New York Metro, um, we had, I believe it was 130 referees, roughly, we had in attendance for that, which is, which is incredible. You know, everybody's giving up their Saturdays and, and, and right now giving up your Friday night to, to become better because you're focused on being better. And this is what it takes to get to that next level for those of you that are uh, either get to the next level or stay at the level you're at. So now we're going to talk about some things like during the season when, when um, August rolls around. So you got before game, during game, and after the game. So we're going to talk about focus and concentration before the game, during the game, and after the game. So before the game, doing your homework. How do you prepare for the game? So, Victoria, how do you, how, when you see assignment come in that says you are going to be refereeing uh, St. John's University uh, men's match, 
what are you doing to prepare for that match? I mean, outside of all the statistical research and everything that's available offline, you can look at game tapes. I'm usually talking to whoever has had either this team this season or the season prior, just seeing what they can offer from a referee perspective, things that you can't get offline. Absolutely. And, and how do you find out uh, who's had their, like, who's, who's refereed St. John's prior? Um, so usually I can look at game tape and figure it out. Um, also, I mean, we're just a huge community, so usually you can shoot a couple of texts and figure it out, um, especially some of the local games. And absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, you know, looking at the film, usually you can see who's working games, looking at box scores. You know, I'm, I, I get a lot of text messages throughout the season from, uh, you know, referees, whether I know them, uh, they're my friends, or just part of the NISOA family. If, if I have a team that's coming from Florida to go up to the Northeast, you know, it's, I have referees that will contact me, shoot me an email. Hey, Lance, do you, any, do you know anything about this uh, team? And usually I can give some quick tidbits because, uh, as we know, different referee styles, different referees, uh, uh, you know, get along. I should say they're, you know, they tr – they, the teams act differently with those referees. So it's not necessarily a blanket statement, but you're able to provide them information on who the star players are. You know, how is the, uh, the technical areas? Um, you know, how are the captains? You know, what's the style of play? You know, those kind of things that can really prepare you going into the match. I'm, I, uh, this is probably if we had one takeaway for tonight, like, I really want people to take this away, and that's mental preparation. You know, you know, all too many times we are, we, we're rushing in life. You know, we, we're leaving from work to go to a game, or maybe we're leaving home. A lot of the times, especially in the New York area, because I've been part of it, where you get stuck in traffic, and hopefully you, you accounted for it, but there are times where you left work late, or, you know, you're you had family commitments that, you know, didn't get you out of the house in time. And now you, you know, you get in there at rush hour and now you're rushed and you're stressed. That's a great time in the car to start mental, mentally preparing for your match. Now, what do I mean by mental preparing is visualizing scenarios. And Carol Ann started to talk about it a little bit where she said, like, there's a hard challenge in the match in front of the bench early. What am I going to do? And she's running these scenarios through her head prior to the match because she's preparing herself. So that way she's not, she's being proactive and she's not being reactive to the situation. She already knows what she's going to do prior to it even occurring. And that's something that I've always taken away uh, from my games is no matter what level official you are, no matter what level of the game you're on, is you're always visualizing the scenarios that happen. First hard challenge in the match, five minutes in, in the midfield. How are you going to deal with it? You know, something to think about. Maybe you take clues. Maybe there are clues from the players and the teams and, and, and things like that. But, you know, you visualize how you're going to handle situations and when they occur and you're not surprised by them, you're going to visualize yourself for success. And I've always felt that when you visualize for success, Chances are those things never happen in the match, but when they do, you're prepared, and then you end up on those video clips for NISOA doing best practices. So I, I truly feel that's extremely important. That's an extremely important part there. And it doesn't take very long. It can be five to ten minutes as you're driving to the game, as you're in the locker room getting ready, as you're walking the field. Those are all times that you can build on this mental preparation. Having a routine. So before the game, what's your routine? This is part of the focus and concentration. Everybody's got a routine, and every, usually everybody's different. You know, when do you walk the field? How do you walk the field? Um, when do you say hello to the coaches? Uh, do you have music that plays in your locker room? A lot of people love to bring the, the wireless Bluetooth speakers and play music before the, in the locker room as they're getting ready. That's a way to be focused in concentration. 
When do you give your pregame conference to your referee crew or to the players, uh, to the captains? Those are all things that you have to have that routine. And once you build that habit, this routine becomes just repetitious and it becomes, uh, you know, automatic. And then you can start to focus on different aspects of the game. I truly feel that's important too, is getting in your routine and not feeling rushed. Because once you start to feel rushed, your focus and concentration now start to diminish. And now you're going to, you're, you're basically, uh, you're living on a prayer when you're in your match because you're worried about other aspects of things that are out of your control and not focusing on the match itself. Uh, if you don't mind interrupting you a little bit there. Uh, to us, mental uh, preparation and readiness is so important that we actually are dedicating an entire webinar just on mental preparation and readiness. And that will be on May 22nd, where we have um, our famous Danola Wilbur doing a presentation on mind traps. And uh, then we're going to have the crew of the uh, 2018 UEFA Champions League final between Real Madrid and Liverpool, giving us a beautiful hour presentation on how they prepare for that game and everything else. So I don't want to interrupt you, but I, we, we, we know mental preparation is, is, is a key component of uh, good officiating out there. Absolutely, and I highly recommend everybody tune into that, uh, especially you know Dr. Don Wilbur, who's been a mentor of mine throughout the years, and he is an incredible individual. He provides such great uh, information regarding mental preparation that uh, there's a lot of value there from Dr. Don. So now we talk about during the game. We all make mistakes. It's inevitable. We make mistakes in every game we do. There's no such thing as a perfect game unless it's a cancellation due to weather. Uh, but everybody makes a mistake. Some are much greater than others. But nevertheless, what do you do when a mistake occurs to get your focus and concentration back? So, Richard, do we have anybody in the uh, the audience that would like to, to chime in here? Like, what do they do? There's a perceived mistake on their end where they feel it in their gut. That I'm a just going to throw. Made. What do they do? What, what yeah, does everybody do here? I'm going to throw somebody under the bus. Uh, Greg Salomon, how are you? Are you with us? Greg, are you there? It's okay. We'll throw somebody else under the bus. Don't worry about it. We'll get someone else. Someone that can talk. How about Assad? Get Assad. Get Assad. Got, because I, I used to work with Assad out in Iowa. I'm so looking, I'm very, I'm looking uh, for him, as a matter of there. fact. You just read my mind. I'm looking We're for him. Focused and concentrated. Where are you? There he is. Uh, he's self-muted. Can you unmute so you can talk, Sam? Uh, nobody wants to talk. It's all right. We'll grab somebody else. Don't worry about it. We'll get one here. We'll get one here. How about Harris? Oh. Harris I want to know Harris's cheat code for getting all the uh, four stimulus quizzes correct. <laughs> you know what? We can I'm get to think uh, if he's got my computer. If he's got my computer hacked or something. I know. Nobody wants to talk. Ziggy, do you want to talk? Yeah, get Mike on. Mikey. Don't be shy, Mikey. We'll grab somebody. Don't worry about it. We'll throw somebody under the bus. Oh, I know who wants who likes to talk. Hi, Kyle. How are you? What's going on, Richard? Lance, how are you? 
I know you hey, like Kyle, what's up, right ahead. You're with Lance. All right. What's up, Lance? How are you? Good, Kyle. How are you? So, Kyle, when you make a mistake in a game, what do you do to put it behind you in order to remain focused and concentrate on your next decision? Uh, yeah, I think it's important, like, if you make a mistake um... – you know, you can't let it affect you you mentally because that's going to have an effect on the next big play you have to make. So you kind of have to, you know, just let it go. You got to move on to that next play. And uh, maybe, you know, when you get a chance at a later time, you know, say something to that player that, you know, you might have missed a foul for. Um, you know, there was fouled. Let them know that, you know, I might have missed that. Sorry about that when you get your chance or maybe even a coach, um, you know, when you have that opportunity, if you really feel you missed something. But I think it's important not to, uh, you know, overthink things. No, absolutely. And that was some of the best piece of advice that was given to me by a former MLS uh, official, Robert Mann, that, you know, you're allowed to make a mistake once for each team and apologize for it. But once you start to make more than one mistake for each team, then you start to lose that credibility. And there's something to be said about being, uh, to having humility there. When you make a mistake, like you mentioned, where you go back, you circle around that player, and, and, and you tell them, hey, I think I missed that one. I don't think I was in the best position, but let me work harder next time. I'm going to work harder for you, so next time I don't miss it. And players really do appreciate that. They really appreciate that because now they know that you, you're human, and now you're going to work harder to not let that happen. And I really think that's important. And it's easier said than done, right? It's easier said than done when you make a mistake to be able to put it past you. You know, like I can give you a prime example of a NCAA tournament game I was doing. And we're at the, we're at the end of the second half, maybe 10 minutes left. The ball gets played in the midfield. It hits me. Next, next it switches teams. Next time it goes down the field. Two touches later, it's in the back of the net. So now I'm feeling awful. And there's not a whole lot of I'm sorry I can say to, uh, to alleviate that, that problem. But you have to regain your focus and your concentration in order to, like uh, Kyle said, in order to be ready for the next play. Because a lot of times coaches can forgive it once. But if it happens a second time, they cannot forgive it. And then it becomes, now it's a problem. So I'm a big believer on having a reset button. Now it says rest, but it's actually reset. So I'm a big believer of having a reset button. And what is that reset button? For me, I wear a wristband. So anytime I make a perceived mistake, I say to myself, I wipe my forehead, and I say to myself, reset. And for me, that resets the entire situation for me. It wipes the slate clean, and now I'm focused back on track. And I actually, uh, those of you that have a subscription to Referee Magazine, I actually read that in Referee Magazine probably like three or four years ago, um, and it was actually in the basketball section. They were talking about uh, basketball official uh, Steve Javi was talking about what does he do because in basketball, things happen so quickly that if you get hung up on a mistake, you are definitely going to miss the next mistake. And I feel it's very important. Everybody's reset button is different, right? Like Carol Ann mentioned, one of the officials had a, a gummy bear and would eat a gummy bear at a certain time in the match, and that helped her reset and maintain focus. Others dig their you know, fingernails in their hand. Other ones wear maybe a little uh, a rubber band and they snap it. Uh, those are the type of things. Now, even though you have this reset button, what can you do if you're still having problems? And that's using your teammates. Many times when we're out there on the field, we make a mistake, we feel we're out there by ourselves. And we just want to crawl into, you know, crawl underneath a rock and hope this game gets over quickly so we can get out of there. And you forget about your teammates and the encouragement that they can have on you and help you be focused in concentration. The visual eye contact, making sure you're using eye contact to check back in with your assistant referees and your fourth official during uh, stoppages of play. 
It could be on a goal kick. It could be on a substitution. It could be on a on a delayed throw in. Those are times to look over at your assistant referees and your fourth official and give them a thumbs up. You know, and then as and on the reverse side of that, if you're an assistant referee and you know your referee is struggling because of a mistake he or she made, you have to be able to recognize that and you have to be able to reach your hand out and pick them up off the ground. And you do that by your nonverbal communication, your visual eye contact, your thumbs up, letting them know, hey, dude, don't worry about it. Wipe the slate clean. Let's go. We've got 80 minutes left. You can do this. Don't worry about it. And, and, and it works the same way with, uh, with referees, with assistant referees that make uh, uh, perceived, uh, you know, maybe they miss an offside decision. Uh, and you can see them that they're, they're very uh, upset or disappointed at themselves. You as a referee have to go pick them up. You have to be inspiring. You have to be uplifting to your crew because there's only three, maybe four of you out there. And both compared to about 40 players, 10 coaches. So you're really, we, you, you don't want to be left on an island. You, you have these resources that you can use in order to help people and help your crews. And then at halftime, what are you doing at halftime to get focused and concentrated on the second half? You know, a lot of the times, you know, assistant referees are talking about, you know, what their defensive line did in the first half. Are they playing a high? Do they drop back? You know, is there an attacker that's usually hanging offside? These are the things uh, that, that need to be discussed amongst assistant referees. And then also adjustments as a referee, things you're making, game control, uh, you, know, you know, game control, atmosphere of the match, safety of the student athletes. We got to make sure these are all maintained. Uh, many of us, when we make a perceived bad decision uh, in the first half, the first thing we like to do in the locker room is go grab our phone. And we, if the game's on ESPN, watch ESPN or ESPN app, we want to pull up that clip. There's no need for that. And the reason I say there's no need for that, because all it's going to do is if a perceived decision that goes wrong, and now you see the video of it, and it's wrong, now it no longer becomes a perceived uh, uh, a poor decision. Now it's factual. So now that really starts to mess with your mindset, your focus and concentration. So, I mean, there's a reason why for the MLS and the professional referees and at the FIFA level, you don't check your phone at halftime because nothing good comes out of checking your phone at halftime. <laughs> um, so and a lot of the times that, that, that doesn't get you back on track. That usually gets you further off track and focused and concentrated. So halftime is extremely important and it can really help or hurt you when it comes to it. And we all do it. We all check our phones at halftime, you know, especially when it's Sundays, when we're looking at the score of for football games, our fantasy football teams. But we have to remember and we have to make it a habit and a best practice that, um, you know, checking our phones at halftime can wait because it's more about being focused and concentrated on the match itself. Yeah, like you're saying, halftime should be used for uh, positive things not negative things. So instead of discussing something that you believe you made a mistake or you know you made a mistake, you should focus on what you did right and what the uh, your teammates did right and, and feed, you know, feed yourself on, on positive thoughts. So once you hit back to the field, you're just, you know, empowering yourself. Absolutely. And what's the plan going forward for the second half? You know, what's the plan? Because, you know, we're, we're going to have a plan when we go out there, just like the coaches are doing, they're trying to put together a plan for their teams for success. And that's the time. That's the only time we get. We get 15 minutes to be able to, uh, to make a plan and make adjustments at halftime. So it's extremely important that we focus on the plan. And when you get in the locker room, immediately at halftime, it shouldn't be, okay, what do we need to do? Take some time to decompress. Take some time to catch your you know, uh, rehydrate and think about and reflect and then be able to have that discussion. And the discussion needs to be honest and open. It needs to be honest and open with your crew 
But at the same time, it needs to be done, as Richard said, in a positive manner. Because, like I said, there's only three, maybe four officials out there compared to 40-plus players, 10-plus coaches. So we really need to be on the same on, on the same page because the players and the coaches can really sniff that out immediately. And they can sniff it out when we feel like we've done a um, – when we're, we're not focused and concentrated. And they will really act on that. So now we get to after the game. So after the game, many of us do a self-analysis. Self-analysis is, is, is very important for your growth as an official. Now, the more games we referee, the 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 higher the the more likely that we are going to become better every time but if you're able to do an honest self analysis post game of yourself or ask your crew hey is there anything in that second half that you know maybe you know I could have done differently or what do you recommend and having that honest discussion it's really going to go a long way with your growth and it's going to really uh accelerate your 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 growth as an official um you know being humble at CONCACAF we talk about being humble and being studious and also being uh, honest with one another and that really helps your development now when I was an active official I say this like I'm old but I'm only 37 uh I kept a journal and after every game I did I would have my little referee journal and I would, I wouldn't do it immediately after the game because you need some time to decompress and really, uh, really, uh, you know, digest what just happened in the match. Usually, but I always did it before I went to bed that night. And when I was fresh in my head and I had time to reflect and I would write down what are three things that I felt I did well in the match and three things that I still need improvement on. And that what I would do as part of that self-analysis is I would look to see if there were if there are common trends that were issues in my matches for the 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 week to two weeks period. And by having the self-analysis and being able to connect the dots, it really helped me focus and concentrate when I went back out on the field. No matter what age, no matter what level I was officiating. It helped provide me some focus and concentration going forward. And at the same time, is you can't lose focus on what you do well, because what you what you do well out there and your strengths, you want to keep getting those stronger. But at the same time as your weaknesses, you want to eventually turn those into your strengths, because you're only as strong as your uh, your weakest weakness. When we talk about mentorship. So who do you talk to after matches? So a lot of the times uh, we have mentors, uh, we have peers that we uh, can find in where we can talk to. We have uh, uh, spouses that we can talk to about our matches, even though, uh, you know, I talk to my wife enough about soccer that uh, I usually end up talking to my brother. I'll talk to my brother about matches, what happened in our matches, what happened in his matches. Um, I'll talk to my friends. I'll watch a lot of soccer games. Uh, we're able to to dec- discuss, you know, like what are some things that I can do to get better. So everybody that's aspiring to be a top level official, whether it be Division One level, College Cup, professional, FIFA, they all have had mentors. It's very important that you have a mentor that you can talk situations through that you can do some self-reflection on, and they can help you come up with solutions. And your mentors don't have to be somebody that has been a FIFA referee. A lot of the times your mentor is, you don't really pick your mentor. It just happens organically, where you either have same of the, the same common interests, maybe you have the same profession, maybe you have the same, a lot of the same social skills, um, so that's an opportunity where you're able to to really bounce some ideas off that person and be able to they, they, to help you grow as an official. And at the same time, if you're at the you know if you're at the um, you're at a position in your referee career where you can give back, you know we talk about this at the Concacaf level all the time. It's always about paying it forward. 
what are you doing to help the next generation of referees be better than you were? You know, Carol Ann Chouinard, I talked about that earlier with her and I, and you know, it was, it was the honest truth is, you know, she has helped a tremendous amount of our uh, newer FIFA referees based on her experiences. And a lot of that has come from people before her. Carrie Seitz has mentored the officials that are now towards the, um, that are more of our seasoned officials right now in CONCACAF. So you always have to have a strong mentor. And I know, Richard, you guys have a, a very strong mentor program in uh, RWISOA. Yes, we do. We believe, uh, uh, like you're saying, uh, instruction is number one. Um, and and pass it on. You got you have to pass it on, and you need to be ready as a referee uh, for the first game, and you need to be ready for the last game. So uh, what we do is we create a path for the senior referees to keep giving back to to the game by becoming uh, assessors, and we have a very strong ass assessment program. Yes. Thank you for uh, bringing it up. And I know a lot of chapters out there uh, that are listening also have strong mentor programs where uh, they they use their uh, more experienced officials within their chapters to help mentor the newer college officials out there um, in their chapter. So th that is a strong uh, learning tool that I hope uh, if chapters are not using that, that they're able to 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 implement it and specifically on spring games because you know let's be honest spring games don't count for records most of the time the players aren't in game condition uh the coaches aren't nearly as passionate but you know they 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 play to win um so those are the times where we could really use to mentor newer officials yeah, you're absolutely right. Those are the type of games, uh, and um, even club, uh, club college, club college is another great platform to uh, to train referees. Uh, absolutely, and, and you know when you get those assignments, you know I, when I get those assignments now as uh, you know a, a senior official, and I get assigned AR1, which uh, those of you on the call that know me, uh, rarely do I run a line, and but when I do run a line. I do a heck of a job, I like to say. Uh, and, you know, when you're, when you're a seasoned official, that's part of giving back. Is when I see my assignment and I see that, oh, I'm AR1, and the referee is a two-year NISOA official, and I'm, I'm there to help them. And you have to recognize that, and you have to be willing to do that, because that's what's going to make everybody better that's going to make the game better that's going to make the players better that's going to make your assigner doing a better job and as well as nisoa better because of the reputation that you're going out there in your activity um and then after the game you got to start thinking about the next game you really have to start thinking about the next game now we've all had it where we've gone and we've done we've we've completed our match and we're feeling good where the adrenaline is still flowing, still running. And maybe it's hard to sleep at night because you did such a great job. It perceived, you know, you, you did a perceived great job. And then there's the other side that you dwell on the, your decisions that maybe that wasn't a red card or maybe I missed dog. So, or, you know, coach was really unhappy with me after the game because he said that I wasn't protecting, you know, his players, you know, and that, that really gets to me and starts to eat at me. You know, you have that 24-hour period where you can do the reflection on it. But because the college season is so short, you have to wipe the slate clean and move on to the next game. When you go to bed and you wake up, you got to be thinking about your next match. You can't be still dwelling on the other match. Now, you can seek out information on, on maybe how to handle situations or, you know, you know sharing your clips with your mentor or, um, or individuals that you, uh, that can get you the correct answer or maybe provide you alternative options. Uh, that's always good to do, but you have to remember that once you've gone to the next day, 
you need to get ready for the next match. And a lot of that is rest. You have to have rest. And that's not the rest button that we saw on a couple slides ago. <laughs> that you have to have rest. And you have to have you have to allow the mind to recover and be able to focus on the next match. And that's getting quality rest. A lot of the times for for the college season, it's that seven o'clock start on Friday, and then you got a, a weather delay, and then all of a sudden you don't kick off till nine. The game gets over at eleven. I got an hour and a half drive home. Oh, and then I got that uh, that that NAIA doubleheader that starts at noon the next day. Oh, and by the way, I got to write my red card report from the night before. So you have to be able to manage that in order to get the proper rest because you have to be ready for the next match. Uh, and just to kind of close it before we start to open up for discussion, uh, I'm gonna leave everybody with a quote here. And it's by Tony Robbins. And those of you that know Tony Robbins, he's a he's, uh, master motivator. And this is a quote that I, I really felt really um, was, you know, particular to this presentation that Richard asked me to do. And it's one reason so few of us achieve what we truly want is that we never direct our focus. We never concentrate our power. Most people dabble their way through life, never deciding to master anything in particular. And to me, that really uh, attributes to, to refereeing. A lot of us are, are happy being at the status quo or, A, uh, I'm going to get my opportunity because somebody likes me at some point. But that's not the case. You have to really make a conscious effort and focus and concentrate and figure out how you're going to be better. So that way you're going to put yourself in the best position to get that next opportunity. You know, and, and I, I truly feel that setting goals is, is a great way to put you on track. Yeah, that's, you're absolutely right. Uh, that's uh, one of the ways, if not the only way. Uh, why don't we open up to some questions? We have so many questions, and we, we, we're we so late. We already passed everything by like 20 minutes. So for those of you that have to go to sleep, we understand. We're going to be replaying this tomorrow like we always do on Facebook and then um, and, um, uh, YouTube. But for those of you that would like to uh, stay for a little while longer, um, we're going to spend a few more minutes going through some questions. So if it's okay with you, Lance, I'm going to open up the microphones here for um, some of the um, the attendees. They have some great questions for you. Fire away. So let's start with uh, Isad. Isad, you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, first name, last name, and where you're calling from, and your question for Lance. Assad Amanovich from Iowa. What's up, uh, Assad? How's it going? Good, man. How are you? How's Iowa? Uh, it's not bad today, actually. It's been pretty nice these last couple of weeks. So, how are things down in Florida? Uh, I can't complain, man. I can't complain. You know, you you walk outside and it feels like a beautiful day, but you know that the uh, the world around you is in a different situation. So you have to keep that in perspective. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I'll try to take up as less time as possible. So my question, you kind of touched on it a little bit. Uh, is there a game in your mind that didn't go the best? And then after the game, you might it might have messed with your focus and concentration. And what did you do to get refocused for the following match? So there's one game in particular, uh, it was a couple of years ago at, uh, at Baylor, um, where I had a, a, a real, it was a real nasty injury towards the last maybe like eight minutes of a match, um, where it was a 50-50 challenge. And it was just one of those where you could feel that it was going to be a train wreck, the two players coming together with, not, with, with no breaks. Mm -hmm. Um and one player got it worse than the other player and she had to be carted off. And, you know, those are the things for me that, that, you know, 
me as a referee, I never want to see players. And I know, Asad, you're a former player that you never want to see players leave your field injured and not return. I mean, regardless if you have any control over the situation or not, because we're there for the student athletes. And that was always something for me to see a player be carted off and not return, uh, especially towards the end of the match that I always felt that it always kind of stuck with me. And, you know, then you got to figure out how do you, how do you wipe the slate clean after the game? You know, for me, it was talking to my assigner who happened to be Manny Ortiz, talking Mm -hmm. to my assigner about it, talking to my crew about it. um, You know, talking to the people that I I feel are mentors to me uh, and be able to refocus because I had another game the next day. And that's just the, you know, the, the true reality of college soccer where you're doing games on back-to-back days. So, you know, being able, it's a little different for everybody, but it's about being able to have a, a network of people that you really trust. And a lot of it comes with your, your friendships that you're able to, to talk to people about your matches and be able to figure out what you could have done differently. And then also mentally visualize for the next match, if that happens, now I know what to do. Yeah, absolutely. Great points. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Asad. Have a good one. You as well. See you soon. Richard, can you hear me? Yes, I got you. Uh, Thank you, Asad. Thank you for uh, staying so late. Uh, we have Andrew Kennedy coming up. Uh, Andrew, you still with us? Hi, Lance. How's it going? Hey, Andrew. How you doing? It's good to good finally talk to you after our email uh, back and forth. Yeah, thanks for doing that. Where, where uh, are you calling uh, from, Andrew? Let everybody uh, know where you're calling from. I'm calling from Western New York up in Rochester. So you're from the other New York, Canada. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So Lance, obviously, <laughs> um, we're in a bit of a soccer drought right now. And my biggest thing was, you know, you've said that you've uh, overcome obstacles in games. But when was a time like, I mean, we've all had goals. My One of my goals was doing Eastern Regional Championships for um, youth soccer this year and possibly going to nationals. Um, obviously, that's not going to happen. Where were where was one of the places where you really ran into an obstacle, um, maybe not quite of this you know global pandemic size, um, but how did you overcome it? Oh, it's a great question. Um, and one thing that sticks out in my head is that when it was 2010 youth championships national championships where you know um i was my first year going to youth nationals i had gone to youth regionals three years before and you know just to get to youth nationals i made it a point to do everything in my power to be prepared at youth regionals in in the south to put me in the best position to get an opportunity to be selected to go to youth nationals now we know, Andrew, when you go to those youth, uh, you know, youth championships, there's a lot of referees, there's a lot of games, and a lot of the time it's you never know who's going to be watching you at what moment in your match. So you have to be sharp from minute one to minute ninety plus, mm-hmm. and you have to be ready to train. You know, we we tell referees in Concacaf, you have to be, you have to train for a hundred you have to train for 120 minutes 130 minutes because you got to be ready to go for the entire 90 minutes the 30 minutes of uh you know additional time extra time 15 and 15 and still have enough in the tank for for kicks from the mark um so that's always been something that i've always kind of taken with me even at uh an earlier stage of my officiating career and then when I went to youth nationals of my first year, I had some, I felt, you know, some good performances, good feedback, but I was disappointed because, you know, everybody wants to do a final. Everybody wants to do a final, but there's not enough finals to go around. 
And that, and in that year, you know, some of my classmates were Robert Sabiga, Alex Chilowitz, you know, great officials, you know, officials that are working, uh, Christina uncle, you know, great officials, you know, so, you know, I, Tori Penso was there. So, you know, officials where, you know, it's very difficult and you have to perform at the highest level all the time. So I was disappointed. So the first thing I did when I got on the, and I, I still remember this to the day when I was on my flight home, I broke out a piece of paper and I said to myself, this can't happen again. I want to go back to youth nationals next year. And when I go back, I want to work a final. So you write down your goals. How, how are you going to measure it? How are you going to get there? And this way you're held accountable. And then you re reference that at time to time to keep yourself fresh and motivated and on track. And then the following year I went back and I was the fourth official on the final. So, you know, it's a little catch 22 there, but the fact of the matter is it, that mindset, it's not about doing the final, but it's that mindset of having goals in mind and working towards them because that sets you up for other, um, other uh, achievements in life. And that's just outside of soccer. It's just having that mindset of being focused, you know, having little, um, you know, taste of adversity, how to overcome adversity. You know, we call that the bounce back effect, elasticity, where, you know, it really, you know, everybody faces adversity at some point in their, in their careers, but it's how you bounce back from that adversity and how quickly you can bounce back from that adversity is what really, really shows, uh, you know, it really tells a lot about who you are as a person. That was great. Great. Thank you, uh, Andrew, for the question. Yeah, thanks, uh, Andrew. We have another one. Uh, let's see if we can get David. David Nunes from San Diego. David, you still with us? Yes, can you hear me? We hear you well, loud and clear, and uh, you're from San Diego, correct? Nice soa, San Diego. Yes. San Diego through Oklahoma, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. How you doing, uh, David? Good to, hey, good to hear from great. you, man. Hi. Uh, glad to uh, be here participating in this uh, webinar and uh, hear from you as well. Your question, David. Well, I, I sent several uh, questions, but I think you hit you got pretty time much for one. Most of them. Uh, well, can you help me which one? I'm just kind of reading right now. Um, so you want uh, me to ask you the question? Well, the question that I think I, you didn't answer, but I think I think the the one that I have is, um, you know, people have different kind of levels of preparations and and focus before, and you kind of mentioned this early uh, in your presentation. You know, listen to music, this, this, and that, but people have a different kind of way. How, how do you kind of really manage that? I mean, just, you know, some people like to be quiet. Some people like to listen to music. Some people like to talk uh, about uh, other things, to relax. Uh, how, do, how do you kind of put everybody kind of together in the same level of focus and, and, and prep before the game? So that's a great question, David. It really is. And that's and that that really deals with managing people. Right. You know, and, and that's what we are as referees out there. You know, we're managing players, we're managing coaches, where we manage people. And we also manage our crews because everybody comes from different backgrounds. Everybody has different experiences. Everybody's at different experiences in their referee careers. And like you said, you know, how do you, how do you manage that? You know, everybody's preparation. And a lot of the times for me is, you know, I try to get to my games an hour and a half before the collegiate games. And I know that's tough in certain areas, but you try to make it a habit because then you build in some time in case you're delayed. But when we get to that hour before kickoff and we're in the locker room after we've walked the field and, and whatnot, I like to use that 15 minutes of that. That's your time. So like as an assistant referee, this is your time to, to, to do what you need to do to get focused. My fourth official, this is your time. My other assistant referee for me. Now, if, if somebody is a, likes to play music, for me, I'm not a music person, but I'm more of a conversation person. 
But usually what will happen is you just ask, hey, do you mind if do you mind if we play some music? And more times than not, they'll say, oh, no, no problem. And then you'll play some music. Or if you ask, what kind of music do you like? And, and things like that help break those break down those barriers. Um, and, and I think that's that's very powerful to be able to manage your crew and understand uh, everybody's needs. A lot of the times, too, during warm ups. Uh, assistant referees will ask, "Hey, can I go check my line, just to make sure that I can find my folk, my my focus points, um, my marks on the field, making sure there's no uh, divots on my uh, on my line, so that way I don't trip or twist my ankle, things like that. That during the warm ups, absolutely, go, go check, go go do what you need to do to get ready. And I and I and that's a great question you ask because it's extremely important that you." Not only are you getting ready as a referee, but you're also in charge of your crew, so you need to help get them ready. And I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Thanks, great. David. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, we way, way, way passed over time and extra time and everything else. We're we almost done. We almost done with the uh, kicks from the penalty mark. So let's see if we can bring. I, I still have like 20 other questions. But I'm just gonna round it up with two. So I'm just gonna pick two names, and that will be the final two questions. So otherwise, we'll stay here until mañana. We, it's it's, hey, that's it's fine. almost hey, mañana that's, for the hey, matter. <laughs> I see 79 people still on the call. So you know, as long as they want to keep asking questions, <laughs> you know, feel free. But please go ahead. All right, let's bring Bill. Uh, Bill Kenny. Uh, Bill, how are you? Again, where are you calling from, and what is your question for uh, Lance? Yeah, I'm calling from Wichita, Kansas. Hey, Lance, I met you last year at the Greensboro combo with uh, elite soccer referees, where we had 300 right. referees there. That was quite yep. an impressive clinic, having 300 officials in one clinic. That was quite an impressive, impressive Bill, that was incredible. you guys put on. Bill, that was incredible. I mean, three, that was the largest that uh, NISO has ever had at one clinic, one educational clinic. Three, we had three, 300, for those of you that are listening, we had 300 referees and we took a giant ballroom in a hotel and it, it was incredible. It was, it, it was, it was very impressive. And that had to do with, with Tysoa and uh, the president, Roger Morton, down there in North Carolina, and they always put referees first. And it's, it's a, it's a, it was a first-class treatment. And I, I strongly recommend uh, anybody on the call that when, when there are clinics down the road in the Greensboro area sponsored by TISOA, that I highly encourage everybody to, uh, to, to partake in those like, like we did, Bill. Yeah, so my question is uh, the coaches and dealing with the bench area so i mean as you go up you know and, and we discussed this a little bit at that the upper levels the coaches and the benches you know you have that fourth official there but they're like you discussed earlier there's a lot of times there's only three maybe four of us that are controlling the game so i mean at the juco level the d3 the d2 level you know the coaches i'm sure you've experienced coming up through the ranks the coaches can be quite challenging have you ever had that coach or that facility that everybody knew that that when that assignment came out that there was a potential that that game could go sideways and what level do you allow or should we allow as a team on the sideline before the coach or what we see a lot is the assistant coaches getting up and barking and taking those cards so the head coach doesn't get that accumulation. So I'm real curious about your bench control and where nice so uh is with the strictness of controlling the bench areas great question and uh um that was a topic that was touched on uh for the coaches roundtable yesterday that uh, nice sponsored 
um, where we talked about bench decorum and things like that. And, you know, it's, as you mentioned too, it's the, you know, you see those, those rivalry games and sometimes the rivalry games aren't necessarily cross town rivalries, but maybe it's coaching rivalries. Um, I always remember when I saw the assignment, uh, University of South Florida versus UConn men, you know, those coaches had a rivalry, even though they were so far apart geographically. Um, and you always knew that you had to be ready for everything. And that starts with the preparation. Now, and you were alluding to that. How do you prepare for that? You know, you really have to, you know, most of us, you know, we give a, a good detailed pregame prior to the start. So we're all on the same page. But when you have these rivalry matches, you know, it starts in your communication with your crews when you send out the emails. Now, you put a lot of your information in terms of rivalries, where teams are, the standings, you know, when they last played, you know, how many fouls and how many cards did they have, what was the score, things like that. And that takes care of a lot of your housekeeping items um, before you even get to the stadium. And then when you're there, now you can, uh, now you can focus on the specifics. Hey, if a coach does this, this is, you know, especially when you don't have a fourth official, you really got to have a game plan with your assistant referee over there. Now, assistant referee one can 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 handle the the bench that they're in front of, but they can't. It can't be to the point where it impacts their ability to 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 do their job in the match. Whereas the other bench is where the referee really needs to have control over, um, and really pay close attention. Now, there's a fine line there, right? So you don't want to have rabbit ears. But at the same time, is you need to be prepared for inappropriate behavior. And how you deal with that is going to be different for every coach. We don't go into matches with preconceived notions of, well, this co coach is a handful. So the first time he says something, I'm going to card him. Because now we're looking for trouble, right? Coaches will give us their opportunities to book them. We don't need to go looking for them. But chances are is we can prevent that stuff from occurring. And a lot of that is how you approach the match when you introduce yourself to the coach. When you shake their hand, you look them in the eye. Hey, coach, how you doing? How's everything? Is there anything special today? Do we have anything, uh, pregame ceremonies or anything? Everything okay? Okay, great. Thank you, coach. You know, not too prolonged, but at the same time as you're showing that you care and you're given a professional approach to the match. And that's another reason why we do, why we warm up because we warm up not only to, for injury prevention purposes, but it's the professional approach we have to the matches that lets the coaches know that, Hey, I got a referee here today. He, she's going to do a great job for me. I can just tell because they're taking this serious. So they might cut you a little bit more slack in the beginning. Um, you know, the tolerance level of coaches, you know, it really comes on experience. Now, there are certain things we can't tolerate, like foul and abusive language. Um, those are things that are, are clearly stated in our, our NCAA rule book that are not to be tolerated. Um, so, you know, and that's part about having the game plan and trying to be preventative with, the, with your coaching staffs prior to. Um, and a lot of that, uh, Bill, comes back to your reputation. You know, your reputation precedes you. And with the things you do, as Carol Ann mentioned, the things you do when people aren't looking is what the habits you're building and become second nature when people are looking. So building that reputation, because a lot of these coaches do watch games outside of their own. And all it takes is them to be watching them and they say, oh, who's that referee? I thought they did a really nice job. And then now when you go to referee them, they can put a name with a face. So a lot of it starts in the pregame with your crew, how you want to handle specific situations. And especially when you have a three-person crew versus a four-person crew, you have to focus even more on the bench. And I, I, put a, I put an emphasis on always covering technical area behavior because you need the, everybody on the crew needs to be on the same page of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And I truly feel by preparing for that, and trying to be preventative is really going to set you apart 
and it's going to be different from game to game. So you can't go in with the same game plan. And you really start to develop and start to um, uh, reevaluate and adjust your game plans based on your level of experience. And this is where you start to lean on your, uh, your, uh, you know, your assessors, because I know you said you're an assessor. You start to lean on these people to give you this advice. So I, I, I hope, you know, even though I didn't really get into too many specifics, but uh, it really comes down to preparation, professional approach, being preventative and respectful to the coaches, but at the same time is drawing the line in the sand where they know that the line has been crossed. Yeah, and that's that was just my main my main question is, you know, it's just like just like anything, you gotta have a backbone. You draw that line in the sand and they step over that, you you have to take care of that. Because if you don't have to. you lose all credibility right then and there, and the players see that, and I mean it just goes away. So I mean it just we we set the tone and if you set the line you draw the line, enforce the line. Exactly. And one of the web, uh, one of the coaches' uh, comments on our webinar yesterday was, "Every referee draws the line differently, and I need to know where my line is. So I'm going to push to see where my line is. And if the referee doesn't deal with it, then." That, that leash gets a lot longer. Now, we have to be careful because, you know, we don't want to draw the line too early uh, on, on trifling things, you know, because there's something to be said about passion. Coaches are very passionate, um, and, and there's a fine line there between passionate and uh, irresponsible. But, and that's why you really have to, uh, you know, attend the clinics like you, like you, like you did um, you know, so, and I'm going to do a plug here, subscribe to the YouTube channel for NISOA and the educational content that's on there, you know, keep attending these webinars and asking questions. Um, and, and also for CONCACAF, you know, we've just created a, a brand new YouTube channel, uh, called the CONCACAF Center of Refereeing Excellence, where we're going to be providing, uh, educational content to r referees of all levels, referees of all divisions all over the world. Because our message is we want to make ref we want we want to help make better referees we want to make excellent referees so I highly encourage you know a bill not just you but everybody listening still listening that uh, to to go on and use those resources you know the NCAA also has great resources on their central hub where uh, dealing with technical area and behavior so constantly seeking out this information is going to only prepare you so Bill thanks for the question. Thank you, Lance. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, and just to sum it up, what you, you said, uh, basically, uh, it's all about preventive officiating, right? And one thing that you need to understand when you're refereeing a JUCO game or a Division three game, even some low Division two games, is the, uh, the difference is not so much the, um, the skill uh, or, or, or the level of play, but the level of acceptance. That's the main difference. So you need to prepare for that. So believe it or not, sometimes when you assign to a JUCO game, you're going to like lay back. Oh, it's a JUCO game. I don't need to go crazy. It's not like a D1 game where I need to prepare myself. No, actually, you need to prepare more because you need to do more. There is more personal uh, uh, player management that needs to be done in a JUCO game, in a D3 game, due to the fact of that level of acceptance. So if you don't train for that, if you don't practice for that game, and you don't uh, uh, give a pregame based on on that, then you're gonna have a problem. Then you're gonna have to be dealing with with the coach's um, you know uh, uh, irresponsible behavior. But most of the time, it has to do with you. Uh, they don't understand where you're calling, so you need to work harder. It's different when you're refereeing a Maryland India uh, Indiana game. You blow the whistle, and pretty much they know 99.9% .9 of the times they know what you call and why you call it. Uh, but in the Juca game, that's not the case. So you need to work extra hard. So correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Lance. Absolutely. The D1, you know, some of my, the toughest games that I still officiate are at the, uh, the NAIA and Division II level um, because uh, there's a, the game is a little bit more unpredictable. Uh, you know, expect the unexpected in those games. 
and, and the teams play a lot. I wouldn't say they play harder, but they're, you know, typically the fields are not in the best condition. They're not the big 120 by 80 fields. They're a lot more condensed. And when you have a, a smaller field, players are condensed around each other and more fouls occur. So you really have to get everybody on the same page there. And a lot of the times, too, with coaches is you have to listen to them. We have to listen. Coaches can give us clues of how if, – if there's if, if there are issues going out on the field, you listen. You, you maybe pick up on a couple of things. Acknowledge them. Coach, with a thumbs up, coach, I hear you. Thank you. I heard you. You know, thank you, coach. I heard you. You know, things like that where you're not being a jerk, you're being compassionate, but at the same time is you're letting them know that you heard them. And you know what? Sometimes they will give us great information where we can make adjustments. And then it's, then the rest is history. But if, if you're going to take this uh, cavalier approach where I'm the boss out there and nobody's going to tell me what to do, that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, a great long, point. And, that, and that's not what assigners want. Assigners don't want that. Coaches don't want that. You know, fortunately or unfortunately, the collegiate game, it's more about partnerships with players and partnerships with coaches. And how can you guys, how can everybody work together for the greater good of the student athlete? Yeah, like you said, many times uh, referees are focusing on the way the coach is communicating instead of what the coach is saying. Uh, if we just pay more attention to what the, uh, what the message is, um, you know, we can, we can uh, end up with a better situation instead of focusing on, on, on the way the coach is communicating. So that's a, a great point right there, Lynch. Uh, we yeah, have we one more question. We can't, for take, we, take, we can't take it personal, right? The coaches are there. For, they have a job. And we can't take it personal, right? But there's a lot of white noise as well that we have to tune out at times. But, you know, for the most part, the coaches will give us good information that we have to listen to. No, most definitely. Uh, let's see if we can bring Carlos Gomez. He's got a, a question for you. Carlos, are you with us? Carlos? Uh, we can't get Carlos, so we're going to bring in Patrick. Patrick, you have a question? Patrick, you still there? Yes, here I am. Hey, Lance. All right, how are I have you? a question for Lance. Go ahead. Hey, Patrick, how you doing? Good, good. So uh, last one of the night. So I'm curious. Um, Ralph Polson made a really good comment yesterday um, in front of the coaches about trying to get some empathy from them about understanding that we're not working with the same crews every time we go to a game. We may not, especially, you know, up here in the Northeast where we're compacted with a, tons of games and a lot of programs, we may see a new person uh, almost routinely every game, or even if we see somebody, we worked with them two years ago. What, what, what are your tips about, I'm very interested in your thoughts on, what are your game critical things? Because I know you do games all over the country. When you fly in or you travel in and you're, you've got a new crew, I mean, all the good things, right? Contacting them before and all, working out all the logistics, but what game critical things do you want to make sure that you communicate to them in the pregame? Great question. And I'll kind of just reflect back on when you and I worked together. Uh, I was at Yale. And yep. it was the first time I've been in the Northeast. And I was coming off a game on Sunday and going Monday to Yale. And I was working with you. And it was a female referee. I think your name was Jamie. Jamie yes. Lynn. Jamie Lynn. Yeah. Um, so I got a great memory. Um, so you, do. <laughs> you, you two were, you, you were two referees I've never worked with before. And, you know, as you mentioned, I do games all around the country, so it doesn't happen very often that there's not one person that I, I, I haven't worked with before or at least uh, know through mentoring in Region 3. So it's about, it's about you know, developing that, those relationships with, with your officials because 
you know, everybody comes from different walks of life and everybody gets to the game differently. But when we're at the game, we're the same. We're there for the same reason. And being able to communicate with one another, you know, uh, talking about different things. And, you know, a lot of the times, too, when I'm uh, when I when I travel in from out of town and I'm working with the, with ARs, typically they have worked together with themselves. So they're usually talking about something. And I try to make it a point to ask questions about it. Or if I'm working with somebody that I know, but yet the third person in my crew is maybe somebody that's new to both of us, I always make sure to include that person in the conversation. Because the more that we can get on the same level cerebrally, as well as being able to communicate with one another, then the coaches are going to know, they, they, the coaches will have no idea that we've never worked together before. And I a lot of the times I'm, I'm asking questions, right? Like, like we, when we did the game, you know, uh, you and Jamie Lynn knew both coaches. Right. And that was a great way for me to say, hey, how, how are the coaches? How, how do they typically behave? How are these teams? And to me, because you, 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 both of you have that great information that I can, I can really rely on. And I thought it was as also, an out-of-towner, you know, go ahead. Sorry, I thought it was also interesting yesterday that one of the coaches said this, that, and it caught, I, I thought about this afterwards. They said that they're very keen on looking how the crew's interacting with each other before the game. So the referee that walks out to the coaches by themselves without the AR, that's a big no-no. That's right. You bring your crew with you, introduce your crew. Right. Uh, absolutely. And, that they flag and, that. And, and one thing we do in South Florida that has really paid dividends is when we do our because a lot of the times the coaches don't know the commitment level that we put in and that's that's just not their fault they just don't know they don't know what they don't know so you know the 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 webinars till 10 o'clock at night on friday the the fitness training the the meetings that we have the rule clinics you know they don't understand that uh, necessarily Whereas Ralph Paulson understands that because he's a current NISOA member. So one of the things we do in South Florida is in our preseason training, especially when there's a rule change here, we will invite our local college coaches to our rules training clinic. So that way it helps them understand the rules a little better and the changes and, and what referees are looking for. And we, we, we invite them to have this roundtable discussion. And they are, they are blown away that the amount of time and effort that referees put into their craft after that. And we tend to find that the relationships we have with our coaches in our local area are uh, tenfold more positive after that because they really get a appreciation for us. And I really think that's a, it's, a, it's a good tool for, you know, the people that are still listening in the, in the chapters to be able to to use that, yeah, I thought that yesterday. I thought that clinic yesterday was outstanding. The feedback that we got from coaches in that session was invaluable, and I think we need to have more of those. Not just one coach, but a panel like that. I'm glad you said that because uh, kind of the plan going forward is we want to make it. We're trying to work on and making it regionalized, so that way we can get different perspectives from different groups of coaches. You know, as you know, this was a panel from the South. Maybe that's a different perspective than the coaches from the Northeast, from the Midwest, out West, things like that. So, you know, be on the lookout for some information possibly coming out uh, and where we're going to have more of those. So I really do appreciate it, Patrick. And uh, I hope all is well. And I hope to uh, see you down the road. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, you know what? It's it's gonna be almost four hours, and we still have over seventy referees. And um, let's take one more question. Let's take one more question. Let's try David again. David, are oh, you there man. now? Yeah. You're in. There you go. Where are you calling from, and what is your question? Um, S San Diego. Um, recently, uh, just moved here. Um. 
okay um you i know that you like it's like we, we previously talked about different uh ways to kind of interact with your uh crew uh and another top on the, kind of the same kind of level that i asked before uh and you kind of mentioned that but we're more specific how do you handle difference of experience in the crew I know that you said that um, as an AR, when you see somebody that's an experienced center, you kind of have that help, uh, you know, that kind of tendency to help them. But how do you kind of really handle, you know, especially, of course, if somebody's an experienced and you say, okay, it's going to be a tough game for this guy, how do you kind of help them to kind of get to a level of comfort and confidence, you know, try to kind of get them uh, uh, to, you know, a level of preparedness for that game. Because sometimes you kind of see that somebody's like not really confident, especially if they make a mistake early in the game or the coach already yelling at them and you're like, oh boy, that, that's going to be a long game. So how do you kind of <laughs> do this as a preparation in the game, knowing that it's going to be a hard game for the person without telling them, hey, you're going to have a hard time uh, at the same time during the game especially towards the end when things kind of may go crazy and you need to have a half time to kind of really kind of calm down and reassess things. That's a great question. Uh, that's another great question, David. And um, you have to understand that the referee is in charge. So like, even if you're a senior official and you're on the line, uh, and it starts in the pregame, you got to remember this is their game. So they need to take ownership of being the leader of the crew. Now, there are things that you can do as a senior official to help uh, with the leadership skills of a, a lesser experienced official. And it starts in the pregame too, asking questions. You know, don't just make assumptions and don't tell the referee what to do, but ask questions. How would you like me to handle this? I have a suggestion. What do you think about this? You know, things like that, that really uh, can pay dividends down the road. And um, at the same time, too, as a, uh, a you know, a, a senior, a senior referee is you can't, you got to remember, too, is you're only, you're only as good as your, your weakest link. You know, you're only as good as your weakest link. So, you know, chances are, if there's a referee mistake out there or a referee crew mistake, everybody gets, you know, the coaches take it out on everybody. So you really have to focus on how can we maximize our, uh, not only our leadership skills, but also maximize all of our, uh, our skill sets in one. And it's difficult when, especially when you don't work together on a frequent basis, like other sports do where they have crews where they work all the time together. Um, but you know, it starts in the pregame starts in when you are, uh, uh, when you contact your crew, how do you contact them? Are you overwhelming with too much information? Uh, do you not contact them until a day before, you know, it's things like that, that you have to, um, you have to really take in consideration. And then during the pregame too, and the pregame walk, you know, like coaches were talking about how they can tell if, if team, referees have never worked together before. You know, how do they check the field? Do they do it together? Uh, is there one person, you know, lagging behind the other or one person way out in front of the other? You know, you really have to, you know, stress uh, teamwork and leadership. So I hope that answers your question. And uh, I know it's only uh, 7 o'clock your time, so you, you probably want to stay on this for another couple <laughs> hours, right? Uh, most likely. Um but think uh, along that line, I have to bring in Carlos Gomez because he's had a he has a question about uh, how do you handle uh, our crew members when they're not focused doing the game. So Carlos, uh, you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Where are you calling from? Yes, Carlos, go ahead. Hey Lance, I'm calling from Maryland, and um, I'm excited about this. I'm really a new Nisoa member, and um, I have a question for you is how to handle your crew members when they are not focused in the game. You mentioned something about um, like uh, important 
a half time and not to check the phones. And believe me, sometimes I even have ARs that have the phones in the pocket in the middle of the game, they're checking the, the phone or, or they're not paying attention to the game. And some people, they get offended or they get mad when you mention something like this. So how you handle that? Because I had an issue and the referee got mad at me because mm -hmm. I was, you know, just telling, look, uh, for me, soccer is serious and I'm there because for so many reasons, but more and more, more is respect for the spectators, players, coaches, and all that. That's very important for me. I, no, absolutely. So, First off, well, welcome to the NISOA family. You thank know, you, and, sir. And I hope you're, you're taking advantage. I mean, I remember my first year being a NISOA member, it was 2008 and, uh, you know, it really opened up a world of, of soccer that I that I really didn't know was even there. Um, the college game is a very uh, challenging game at all levels, but at the same time, it's 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 very safe. You know, nothing you know crazy is going to happen. Like like what could happen on like your Sunday amateur level games. Uh, mm -hmm. so it's a safe environment. Um, so welcome to the family, and I hope you. You take advantage of all of our educational opportunities that, you know, NISOA and RWISOA are providing. And to answer your question, uh, it's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult. And it really takes a, a, a special type of skill set to be able to, uh, you know, be able to manage your crew when, you know, maybe things aren't going the way you think they should be or people aren't acting the way they should be. Um, mm -hmm. I recommend a book called verbal judo okay and and it's a book that's been recommended to me and that when i first started officiating and basically it's the art of persuasion it's written by a, a former police officer and it talks about like how do you how do you get people to do what you want them to do without telling them you need to do this mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it really works hand in hand with the police officers it works hand in hand with our players and it works hand in hand with our officiating crew because, you know, you don't want to be the dad when you're out there telling your crew, Hey, put your phone away. Hey, right, do this, right. hey, do that. But you gotta, you gotta, it's almost like, you know, you gotta plant the seed with them to say, Hey, uh, is everything okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, is there anything, you know, anything, you know, Hey, let's talk about this or, you know, something's bothering you. You want to talk about it right now? Like, is there something, you know, I can help you with, you know, showing some compassion to your, your crew. Uh, can really go a long way too. So the book, Verbal Judo, Art of Persuasion. I don't even know if they make books anymore. You can probably get it online, but well, uh, I think it's definitely I, one to check out. Yeah, I think I, I saw the book somewhere. I'm gonna think so. I'm gonna get it. And also sometimes on the headsets, you know, they talking about stuff that is not related to the game. So we're in the middle of the game, and they, how you just say, hey, look, just focus on the game or what, what, what is your advice? So that's a good one, too, because it's easy to use the, the headsets to have uh, commentary as opposed to being uh, uh, an aid to, to, for communication. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are times where I catch myself talking maybe a little too much, too. And I tell my crew ahead of time, hey, if, you know, for, if, if there's too much talk on the mics, don't take it personal. If I tell you, hey, we, we got to cut it down because, okay. we need you know, and if you do that ahead of time, you kind of set the table. And at the same time, I tell them, too, hey, if, if I'm talking too much on the mics and it's, un, it's, you know, it's interfering with your ability to focus, let me know. Sure. Because I'll make the adjustment. So it's kind of like a two way street there of respect level. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got it. Yes, that was great. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, thank, thank you, you again sir. for logging in and thank you for your question. All right. Uh, we are we can stay here all night long, but you know what? Uh, I'm going to get my uh, rear end kicked if I don't uh, end this soon. <laughs> well, Richard, you know, thank you very much. You know, thank you for everybody that stayed on. I see there's 65 people that stayed on. You know, uh, you know it just shows the commitment to and the dedication that everybody uh, is making during this time to become better. 
uh, you know, NYSOA, I can speak from NYSOA uh, from my heart because it's meant so much to me uh, that, you know, we really truly are thinking about everybody that's going through this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And our thoughts and prayers are with everybody, especially the first responders. And, you know, please, you know, take advantage of our stimulus quiz because the purpose of the stimulus quiz was not only education, but it was also to be able to provide uh, a little bit of relief to, uh, to our membership because, you know, Dr. Ray always said family first and NISO is truly about family. And, you know, we, we are one big family. We are a big family, and I like to end it with a special um, person. I just gave him, I uh, opened up the mic. We have a Hall of Famer. It's uh, almost, what time is it? Like 10, 10 p.m. We have a Hall of Famer uh, with us, David. Uh, David, I just gave you the mic. I don't know if you have the mic. We're going to say a couple of words before we go, uh, we'll go to sleep. David Zimmerman with us, ladies and gentlemen. David. All right, we can we can get through David, but believe it or not, we have a, a Hall of Famer uh, for the entire uh, webinar. That's almost four hours, so that's amazing. Um, uh, David's so an excellent, what an an incredible person. I met David at the my first ever uh, postseason assignments were the NURSA Club Championships, and he was the coordinator of officials. And I met David there, and he provided me such great feedback in my matches when he watched them. Um, and then, you know, we were able to reconnect years later. And uh, I know he's really dedicated to NISOA. He does a lot of education for NISOA uh, in the Northeast, and, you know, we, we really appreciate his commitment. Yeah, that's why I wanted to bring him in uh, for final words. But uh, next time, we'll we'll set something up for next time. So um, we had a great day. Uh, Jesus, what a day. So we had a lot of questions, a lot of good questions. It was a pretty good show, don't you think? What do you think, Lynch? Oh, this is great. It's awesome. I mean, the fact that you had you had Hassan on, right? I mean, I wasn't on when Hassan was on from Ref6. Yes. So you had Hassan, who, I mean, the things they're doing at Ref6 are incredible, and that's why NISO partnered with them last year. And we're going to continue our partnership. It's a three-year partnership uh, with, with Ref6 uh, to be able to provide uh, a select group of our officials uh, an opportunity to partake in uh, the pilot program that Ref6 is uh, implementing, as well as provide our the rest of our membership with a discounted rate, um, NISO member exclusive rate for Ref6. And then you had Nice old Hall of Famer, former FIFA AR George Nugent on the call, who is who is an even more just such an amazing person and has helped me out uh, drastically uh, since I've become uh, you know since I started uh, working for NISOA and representing them on a national level. And then who can forget Carol Ann Chenard? She's a legend. You know uh, what was it? Two World Cups. I mean, I counted three World Cups from the last one because, you know, she was a month out and she was already training for it and invited and partook in all the camps. And, and then you know, had to all be honest with you, I, I think she was uh, right down line for that final too. Uh, she's, she's, she's uh, not, a, you know, she is one of the best referees in the world. And that, and that's, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, gender blind is she's the best. She's one of the best referees in the world. And it was it's a fantastic to be able to have her on, be able to share her story and, and be able to provide some motivation and hopefully inspire somebody that's listening on this call. Uh, and how, to, how humble, to, to how humble she is. Unbelievable. Absolutely. And that's one thing that I really want to um, make sure that all, all the young referees understand, especially the ones that start moving up. They, they've been doing the ones for a couple of years and now they think they're they're superstars and sometimes they just look down on new referees they shouldn't do that because if you think about it uh last last week we had a 2006 uh fifa world cup fin final uh referee with us and he was so humble 
uh, this week we have um, Carol Ann, and she refereed in so many great games, and she's so humble. So that tells you something. Uh, the you know the higher you get, the more humble you should become, and that's the only way you can get to the top. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Lynch. Uh, that's that cocky calf. We're not looking for just uh, great referees. We're also looking for great people. Um, you know, and they have and the right people that, working for them. Have uh, to. You, 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 you've been there yourself, and you're so humble. Uh, we can reach out, uh, pick up the phone, and and and, and connect with you uh, any given moment. And if you're busy, you text back, and I'll and I'll get back to you. And you do get back to us, so that's amazing. Uh, we know you're super oh, busy. I mean, you still have time for us, uh, for us meeting all the chapters and all the referees. So I really appreciate everything you're doing for uh, NISOA. You're bringing NISOA to the next level, that's for sure. My pleasure. And those of you that are still listening on here, 61 people, uh, you know, keep working hard, keep attending uh, these events, uh, these webinars. I mean, next week you got Terry Vaughn. I mean, uh, I mean, sh- Terry's incredible. Terry's the best, the best. You know, I have so many great Terry stories uh, where he was at tournaments where I was refereeing youth tournaments and he was there as an instructor. And he's just such a reproachable person um, that, you know, you would, you meet him and you talk to him, you would never think, whoa, this guy, this guy's done international level games. Like he's treating me like I'm an equal, you know. And, and he's and so likable. Really, so it personifies, that really personifies who he is and, that's 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 one of the reasons why we we started the, the you know two years ago we did it you know 2018 and now 2019 where it's the you know Terry Vaughn you know referee of the week for Nisoa because you know it's not only about being a good person you know good referee but it's about being a great person off the field too and that's what Terry was Terry still is you know, yeah you Terry got Ryan is Sigic, you know you got Ryan mm-hmm. Sigich in the NCAA he's gonna talk about the rule changes that are coming out and you know, a lot of, you know, specify some things. And NISO is working with the NCAA to create some educational content. We're going to be collaborating on some of the rule change stuff. Um, so, you know, be on the lookout for that. Uh, you, uh, what can I say about President Huber? I mean, his vision, these last two years, the people he's bringing on board that are relevant, and he's really allowing us uh, the freedom to, to run with a lot of these initiatives that we're doing. You know, he really believes in NISOA and believes that NISOA has a place to develop the top level officials in this country. And then, of course, Corey Rockwell, you know, the man, the myth, the legend himself, where uh, the only difference with him is he holds a flag in the professional level and he holds a whistle at the college level. So he brings a great, unique perspective on uh, on the game. So, uh fantastic and you know thank you everybody for staying on i really do appreciate it And if you ever have questions like richard said you know i've already received a couple emails in my email box uh, lance at nisoa.com so you're always welcome to send me an email and uh, I, if i can't get back to you right away uh, at least give me a couple days and i'll circle back around so you know thank you for everybody and thank you for all you do and richard and uh, victoria you know thank you for what you do because you guys are really making a difference Thank you. And and again, thank you, um, everybody, for logging in. And uh, unfortunately, it's time to say goodbye. And uh, we'll connect again, again in a week. Everybody, thank be everybody. safe. Be safe. Have a good one.